Hello and welcome everyone to what is going to be a unique episode on this channel. I'm sure those of you who are only familiar with my uh, history videos are going to find this uh, a bit strange, this uh, sudden whiplash that I'm covering a video game from 20 years ago. Nevertheless, if you are familiar on this channel with my work with Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien Day, the Ardoranye, the history of Middle-earth and the Silmarillion series, um, this is but an extension of that, but it is, I need to emphasize, going to be a standalone episode. I have no intention of covering the other Howard Trilogy games, the uh, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, or the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, and I may get into that towards the end. Um, suffice to say, if people want me to talk more about the actual gameplay, um, you can ask me questions regarding the end, and that can form part of an extended epilogue. Indeed, I'm happy to uh, let this stream go on as long as possible. But as for the main event, this stream, as with my Lord of the Rings themed content, is going to be covering the world building of the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, uh, but through a historical perspective. This is not going to be a lore dump, albeit I'm going to try and understand more aspects of the Morrowind law um, and the political system, the social system, the economic system, and indeed the uh, mainline story and that of his extension tribunal. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm reading history into Morrowind. I'm going to be coming up with various historical analogies, of which there are many, and I'm going to be using comparative theology, again, in terms of being able to um, unlock various aspects in terms of understanding the story. Uh, this is actually a joy for me finally to cover, and Morrowind is really the only... Uh, game where I feel incentivized to actually uh, pick apart because I do really believe it's worth it. Um, there may be a bias or prejudice against looking at video games as an art form, uh, but Morrowind is really an exemplar when it comes to uh, creative world building. Indeed, um, unlike a film or even a book, uh, the interactive nature of Morrowind perhaps allows you to become even more in depth, uh, even just looking at the world and the fact that there is in-universe law and uh, law is an essential part of the story as well. I don't mean law in terms of L-A-W, I mean L-O-R-E. Um, but without further ado, having explained all that, um, and also I want this uh, to be a, a, a cozy stream. I, I mean, I'm used to uh, barreling out uh, tons of uh, detail and information, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, if people want to um, send super chats or ask me questions about uh, particular aspects of what I feel about the Elder Scrolls series as a whole, um, I can answer throughout the stream or in an extended uh, section towards the end. But as for my reasoning uh, to cover the uh, topic of Morrowind, uh, it may come as a surprise to you, but I see it as essentially a Spenglerian story. Uh, it is the tale of the decline and fall of Dunmary civilization. It is a story of decadence. It is an example of cyclical history. The Dunmary are a self-contained culture, and they are a culture which is redefining themselves under repeated assaults from within and without. Indeed, to look at the cyclical nature behind the story of Morrowind, to look at their gods. Their gods are both the anticipations, and after the fall of the tribunal, they are the reclamations. Uh, with Nerevar, the, the principal protagonist and player character of Morrowind, essentially acting as a tonic uh, in the Morrowind civilization that both restores and indeed purges. Hence, the ending of Morrowind is very much bittersweet. But added to the Spenglerian aspect of uh, decadence and decline, uh, there is also very clearly a Wagnerian motif running through Morrowind. It is the Elder Scrolls' response to Goethe Damrung, the twilight of the gods. We have the equivalent of the norms and the fates uh, threading um, uh, the prophecies. Um, uh, the, fundamentally, this is a story about determinism, versus free will. And we have other aspects such as, I, I would say, the betrayal of Siegfried, uh, the fall of Valhalla, uh, the destruction of Odin's sphere, uh, spear, and uh, the ending of the gods, and uh, all the sort of rich character information that you can draw from that. Uh, but for those of you who aren't really aware of who's responsible behind Morrowind. Obviously, Todd Howard uh, was the executive producer, but the principal writers of this game uh, were Michael Kirkbride 
uh, Ken Rolston, who acted as the lead designer, uh, Douglas Goodall, and Mark Nelson. And I'll also be indebted throughout the stream to uh, various concept artists. You're going to see their art uh, throughout the presentation here. Uh, just to mention a few, Hope Adams, uh, Sharon Arkaisi, uh, Noah Berry, and again, Michael Kirkbride. So in terms of forming a structure for this, because I'm going to be going into a lot of depth, I want to go over the aesthetic of Morrowind first. I then want to get into the origins of Dunmary civilization. Uh, I want to cover the political situation, and I want to end off by covering the actual main story of Morrowind. So without further ado, uh, here we go. Uh, so this is the island of Vardenfell, rather deceptively, Although the game is called uh, The Elder Scrolls Morrowind, uh, the actual game is only focused on the northern central island you see on the right map here. This is a map from the subsequent game Oblivion. Uh, the island of Vardenfell is essentially described as a, a, a sort of very inventive and rich uh, high fantasy setting, um, contrasting with a lot of, you can say, uh, I hate to say it, cliche fantasy games, uh, where it's essentially a faux medieval setting with um, some uh, magical mechanics or things like that thrown in and the occasional sort of uh, magical beasts. Um, Morrowind, I, I think, is able to convey a clearly alien world, especially alien in terms of the context of uh, uh, North America and uh, Western Europe. Um, surrounded um, by the volcanic ash of the uh, of Red Mountain and the uh, streams of lava in Malagamar, uh, you have the swamps um, of the Bitter Coast and the West Gash. Uh, you have the Grayslands in the north in the northeast. Uh, you have the uh, sort of abandoned and uh, strategically useless uh, archipelago in the north, which is Shea Gorad. Um, you have the Azuras Coast, which I would say has the most sort of uh, uh, grandiose high fantasy aspects to which I'll get into a moment. And then you have the economic heart of Morrowind, which is in the Ascadian Isles in the south. Um, as a result of the tribunal expansion, um, which came out after the main release of Morrowind, uh, you're able to visit the capital of Morrowind on the mainland, Morhold, uh, but we are unable to see uh, cities such as Narsis and uh, cities such as Blacklight, um, albeit Blacklight is very prominently referenced in the uh, Dragonborn expansion to um, Skyrim. And as this indeed pertains to the world building of the Dunmary people, and indeed what happens essentially after the... Uh, uh, defeat of Degofer. It may be quite interesting to come back to that. But in terms of what I believe inspires this, because deceptively, um, Morrowind is able to create um, the impression of a truly alien world in a way that doesn't, at least to me, seem derivative. I will be unpacking, I believe, all the inspirations here, but what Morrowind does, which I believe Skyrim and Oblivion fail to do, uh, is create a new world based on so many different intermingling inspirations uh, in a way that doesn't seem uh, derivative. Maybe someone will be able to uh, disagree with me with that, but um, I'm able to, to see, however, um, some clear inspirations, but rather than detract from my uh, appreciation, because I can read so much in Tomorrowwind, and when uh, uh, playing it, and I did uh, play a little bit just um, in preparation for the stream and as part of the research, um, my head is always just um, completely sort of uh, lit up in terms of uh, illuminating all these various uh, analogies. So looking at the... Uh, the supposedly sort of alien and high uh, fantasy world of Morrowind, I was thinking, okay, this, there has to be some sort of inspiration here somewhere. And it's not just a geographic inspiration, but there is a clear civilizational inspiration behind the uh, uh, making of the world of Vardenfell. And the clear image I got is looking at this, which is a 19th century painting, 1875, by one Jose Maria Velasco of the Smoky Mountain and the White Mountain in the Valley of Mexico. Um, indeed, I think Mesoamerican civilization is in key in terms of being able to unlock uh, a historical reading of Morrowind, uh, that and also uh, Mesopotamia, the land of the rivers. But there's also inspiration from uh, ancient Israel, uh, Iran, 
very clearly, or rather Persia, uh, India, and indeed Japanese history. Uh, but just looking at this painting here, I couldn't help but feel then trying to recontextualize Vardenfell within some sort of uh, redesign or fantasy sort of um, uh, reimagining of the Valley of Mexico, uh, just standing on the cliff here, um, this or rather the hill. I mean, you can't help but feel having played the game. And I do advise you to all go out and play the game. And for those who are, I would say, a little cautious about getting into it, who have tried and have failed to get into it, I may be able to um, give a bit of advice uh, throughout the course of the stream. Uh, but standing here on this hill, I very much feel that I'm in Sage of Mora. I'm looking out from the uh, the great mushroom tower, or maybe even uh, Telfir, uh, Divafir, who is um, one of the greatest of all the Dunmerry wizards, looking out from his uh, mushroom tower and looking at the Mount Kand of Malagamar, and even further in the distance, the uh, Red Mountain itself. All that's missing in this image is the uh, prevalence of the uh, uh, blight infested ash storms, which uh, routinely plague Morrowind. But indeed, if you look at this image, I very much feel that this is an idyll which accompanies the end of the story of Morrowind when Dagoth Ur is finally defeated. Um, so, taken from those inspirations, I also want to continue this looking at this perspective, I believe, from the um, uh, from Azura's coast and go here, uh, which is the 19th century pre-industrial Mexico City uh, based on the partially reclaimed Lake of Mexico, which was the basis of uh, Aztec um, civilization from the 14th and the 16th century. And I can't help but feel for those playing the game, just looking at this image, this, uh, this beautiful painting by Velasco and finding myself in the Ascadian Isles, looking at Vivek and seeing the uh, the Ashlands and Malagamar again in the distance. So I feel that the comparison to the Valley of Mexico um, is very apt here. And it's only reinforced when you look at the more um, uh, specific elements. Um, indeed, if one associates the city of Vivek with that of Tenochtitlan, and I'm going to get into the, um, the intricacies here, so having set up the land of Resdane, later Morrowind, uh, how do we get there in terms of creating a semblance of a Dunmerry culture? Um, the Dunmerry culture, which is very much, you can say, the, the centerpiece of this game. Um, it isn't a traditional sort of hero's tale in the sense that the story is really about the player. The story is so much more than the player. The world building of Morrowind and the Dunmerry civilization are, are the essential focus. And so, looking at the origins of the Dunmerry civilization, you can see all the themes which are going to be repeated throughout the course of the game. Um, the civilization is attributed to Saint Veloff, uh, the prophet Veloff. Um, at a start, I very much are reminded of two figures. Uh, one, of course, is Moses um, leading the Jews across the Red Sea uh, to found the land of milk and honey in, uh, in Israel, except in the course of Morrowind, this is going to be the land of fungi and ash. Um, another comparison I can draw, historical analogy I can draw, uh, is that of the, um, the high priest Tenok um, of the Aztecs, traveling from the primordial realm in the north of Atzlan uh, to the Valley of Mexico, um, avoiding various attempts of the local peoples there to, um, to kill them, being exiled repeat, uh, repeatedly, until finally um, they find a string of marshes in the middle of a lake where they can form some sort of defensive settlement, and that becomes the basis of the great city of Tenochtitlan, which is the center of the modern-day Mexico City. Um, but of course, as with these aspects of Moses and Tenok leading the people, the Dunmerry people at this moment, the Chima, um, out to form this new homeland in uh, Resdane, uh, of course, they weren't native to this region. Uh, they were originally a group of people called the Almeri, uh, who were essentially the uh, Elder Scrolls equivalent um, of the High Elves or the uh, the Noldor and Lord of the Rings. Indeed, there are there are aspects of the Elder Scrolls. Um, uh, law, which I do find quite grating. So, for example, the Somerset Isles, the alternative name of the Somerset Isles, the homeland of the High Elves, uh, is also called Alanor, Alanor 
which of course taken from Valinor, uh, from the Silmarillion, uh, the land where the, the Valar dwell and the intended home of the elves who live together with the Adra in the case of the Elder Scrolls. The Adra are the Ainur or the Valar and the elves are essentially the same. But where you can say that there are aspects, of course, where you can say Veloth imitates the Lord of the Rings and acting as some sort of Feanor-esque figure, uh, choosing deliberately to depart um, the land of Valinor, cross over the sea to Beleriand and wage war against Melkor. Uh, that really is only a superficial link, even though one could say it was perhaps an inspiration behind the original passage of the Dunmerry people. Uh, but the Chima as a civilization uh, begin as a break off, an offshoot um, of that original Aldermary civilization, uh, one which is essentially clouded in mystery as to why Veloth uh, decided to break away from Aldmeris and go off and form his own civilization. Um, thematically, you can say that one of the things that defines the um, uh, Dunma in contrast, the Aldmeri is they are a very pragmatic people. You can also say they are a barbaric people in many ways. Um, indeed, I think a lot of uh, Elder Scrolls writers, especially the authors of Skyrim, uh, had a, you can say, a moral disdain for the Dunmeri culture, which is why they ended up destroying it in the way that they did. And I'll get into that later. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a major cultural breach with Aldmeri, and there's a religious breach. Um, you can say this is uh, Moses's burning bush moment where God comes to him and tells him to uh, release the Jewish people from bondage in Egypt. Uh, but within the context of the law of the Elder Scrolls, this could be seen as the first intervention of the gods contriving, you can say, the dominion over the Dunmeri people through the intercession of dreams. Veloth, who is receiving dreams and is utterly convinced that he must bring the Chima people away from Aldmeris and form this new land. Um, who will be behind, you can say, this uh, manipulation? Uh, the in-universe god Boethia. Boethia, who, again, one theory is, um, came under the guise of Trinimac. Trinimac, who was one of the most graceful um, and popular of the Adra, who was later taken by Boethia eaten and spat out as the god of the spurned Malakath. But we take all these elements and you can say that Veloth was acting as per a genuine inspiration to go off and break with the traditions of the Aldmeri uh, civilization. But on the other hand, you can say that he was nothing more than the dupe of the Daedric god Boethia, who wanted to detach a certain people from Aldmeri civilization um, and bring them over and form a new civilization which would venerate Boethia and by extension the quote-unquote good Daedra, um, Azura and uh, Mephala. But of course what sort of substantiates this theory that right from the outset we are talking about this uh, friction between uh, the will to power and determinism and the, uh, the book of fate uh, is that of course Boethia perhaps appearing to Veloth in the guise of the beautiful Trinimac, um, is essentially the Prince of Plots. Uh, so right from the beginning, we could have the Dunmeri culture, which is controlled by dreams, which anyone who has um, played the game uh, will understand that there is a fundamental tactic. Indeed, that is the basis of Dagoth's, uh, Dagoth Ur's plan to create dominion over Morrowind, and then perhaps by extension over all Tamriel. And uh, yes, as someone mentioning in the chat, uh, the Adra, are kindred to the Aldmeri because they are considered to be the um, the ancestors of the uh, the Aldmeri civilization, um, whereas Daedra simply means not our ancestors. The Daedra have their own separate realms um, uh, disconnected from the world in the Elder Scrolls, which is that of Nern. And the Adra are, as we'll get into, is typically are typically associated uh, with having benevolent virtues, whereas the Daedra are at best amoral and are worse characterized as uh, outright evil. Um, in the case of Molag, uh, uh, Molag Baal probably being the most extreme example of that. So we have all of these inspirations in terms of being able to um, understand uh, the passage of Veloth in some sort of historical context. I mean, looking at the 
barbaric theory in particular, looking at um, the Aztec comparison with the prophet Tenoch. Uh, the Aztecs, if you look at uh, Arnold Toynbee, uh, he characterizes them as representing some sort of uh, a Mesoamerican primordialism, uh, the Mexican people essentially representing a more primitive version of the far more urban and sophisticated sophisticated culture in which they found themselves. And that was based around their worship of uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh, the god of war. So if we're looking at a conscious rejection of, you can say, decadent urban civilization and the creation of something more far harsher, more warlike, more pragmatic, um, there is again a link here. But moving on to, you can say, the aesthetic um, inspiration. So Veloff arrives in the land of Resdane and presides supposedly over a golden age um, through the Merific eras uh, into the first age of the uh, of the Elder Scrolls. And just looking at the architecture, because of course they're not alone in Resdane, they have to deal with the Nords, uh, who are a human race. Uh, most, I think all people will be aware of the Nords uh, through having played Skyrim and many far more people watching this have probably paid Skyrim than ever picked up Morrowind. Uh, and of course the Dwemer, um, the Dwarven race, uh, known essentially for their um, expert uh, craftsmanship and their technological prowess, which superseded that of any other civilization. And indeed, despite their disappearance thousands of years ago before the events of Morrowind, uh, they were still far more technically advanced than anything that's ever came after them. Uh, but just looking at the architecture, on the one hand, we have the Meso Mesoamerican influence, which is very clearly evidenced in terms of the construction of great pyramids. But of course, I also see um, Mesopotamian influences. So this on the top left is a drawing of the Ziggurat of Ur, uh, which was recently uh, reconstructed in Iraq. Um, and of course, if one looks at the sort of religious significance um, of the ziggurats and pertaining to all sort of, um, first of all, uh, Sumerian civilization, uh, Elamite civilization, Assyrian civilization, uh, Babylonian civilization, um, I do believe there are very various influences there. I mean, if you go on to the conceptual drawings in the center here, which are that of the Duema, um, you can definitely see the Sumerian influences there. And I think one of the most uh, classic examples um, when it comes to the sixth house uh, is the image, um, the third image across, uh, which is that of the ash vampires, who are the principal servants of uh, Dagoth Ur and the creatures that, as the Nereverine, uh, you have to kill um, and acquire Keening and Sunder before you find, uh, go off and finally uh, take out Dagoth Ur. But combined to this monumental architecture, the ziggurat-esque architecture, um, which is also, I think, uh, very in evidence when you look at the Dunmeri strongholds littered throughout Morrowind. Uh, we have the four corners of the House of Troubles on the right. Uh, we have this um, perverse, twisted uh, architecture, which is typical of the ruins, the outcast within Dunmeri civilization. And what is typical from the quote-unquote golden age, the Velofi golden age, is that having created Chima civilization um, out of a schism from uh, out of the Almeri, the Chima and later the Dunmeri will repeatedly go through a phase of schism, um, not only in terms of the context of Adra to Daedra worship, but within the Daedra themselves and who they worship. So for example, Veloff uh, venerates the good Daedra and the outcasts venerate the bad Daedra. And that's, of course, ignoring the other Daedra, which don't have a significant presence in the story, um, such as uh, Periite. Um, so, sorry, my mind is uh, going uh, blank um, or in terms of uh, nocturnal um, and other figures like this. Um, so as a result of this, we have many different architectural traditions which are representative of the gods that the Chima worship themselves. Um, but like I said, in terms of historical inspirations uh, with these Mesoamerican and Mesopotamian civilizations, uh, someone uh, in the chat is mentioning Sheagorath. No, Sheagorath is one of the four corners of the House of Troubles. Uh, but moving on from the clearly sort of man-made inspirations, we go on to the high fantasy inspirations. And something that I've tried to make clear here is that of the exceptional nature of Chima and later Dunmeri culture. 
um, and that of, you can say, of an associated barbarism uh, compared to the sophisticated urban culture of the Almeri or later the Altma, uh, which is the fact that they are so connected to the land of Resdane and later Morrowind um, that they take their cue from the various resources that they find and they transform uh, the natural environment, essentially using these various tools at their disposal. So when it comes to the House Redoran and you see the uh, Redoran houses on the bottom left and you look at the uh, civilization of Aldrun, um, and you can't help but feel, again, that this is completely alien. Um, Scar, which is the center of the council of uh, House, House Redoran, uh, is actually a massive mud crab. Um, a mud crab shell. Essentially, they are living uh, within the carcasses of um, of a uh, sort of slayed crustaceans. Um, of course, this sort of builds into the fantasy element. But going back to Spengler, um, Spengler focuses on this idea of civilization essentially being that of an organism, and so connected are the Chimera and the Dunmeri to the land of Resdane that they actually take the creatures and the fauna and fauna of Morrowind and they transform it and make it into their home in addition to these physical structures we see. And this is extended on the image of the right when we come to Sager of Mora. Sager of Mora, which is the capital of House Telvani, is not the exclusive home of Telvani. There are various uh, greater mushroom towers representative of the great council members of House Telvani. Um, but again, this goes so far as to represent that Morrowind isn't just a state, it isn't just a nation, but you can say it's a living organism uh, with the Chima, Dunma, um, becoming that much closer in terms of their association with the nature of the land they find themselves in. Like I said, um, a land of uh, fungi um, and ash. And like I said, this is at once, you can say, high fantasy. There are clearly inspirations with uh, Sage of Mora uh, taking the example of, say, Doriath um, in the Silmarillion um, or, sorry, just going over my mind, um, uh, Mirkwood or looking at uh, Lothlorien uh, in Middle-earth and associating this essentially with um, taking the forest cue from the elves, uh, which of course already exists in the Elder Scrolls universe with the example of Valenwood, and taking it and putting a new spin on it, which is the construction of the Mushroom Tower. So that forms the basis of the Velofi civilization, or you can say the um, original connection of the Chimera and later the Dunmeri um, to their homeland in terms of being able to wed it to the actual uh, natural climate in which they find themselves. And of course, this is extended in terms of the very clothes they wear. Um, so they take the shells of these various creatures slain and they turn them into armor. Uh, so we have chitin armors and we have uh, bone mold armors. Uh, and of course, there are some clear Far Eastern influences when looking at the um, uh, the hats essentially worn of the uh, the gondola drivers uh, and the various uh, fishermen and boatmen um, operating along the uh, uh, the Gash and Azuras and uh, the Bitter Coast. And of course, I think bon bone mold armor is the most iconic. And perhaps uh, people are aware of this again through um, their appearance in Skyrim through the, uh, the Dragonborn extension. Uh, but moving on from the original sort of primordial architecture of the Chima, uh, you come to the tribunal era where the Chima had been cursed by Azura and they could become the Dunmeri civilization. Um, taken from this image, which I brought up earlier, which is the idol of the Escadian Isles and uh, Velasco, and coming here to the actual city of Tenochtitlan. Uh, obviously, uh, Tenochtitlan um, is Vivek. I mean, the Aztec influences are so clear in terms of understanding a geographic, architectural, aesthetic, and uh, uh, civilizational, um, religious through line in terms of being able to understand the particular in, uh, particularness uh, of the Chima and now the Dunmeri civilization. Um, you can see, of course, the uh, the great bazaars and the cantons, um, and indeed uh, the Grand Temple of Vivek, which of course looks like the uh, the great pyramid at the center of Tenochtitlan, uh, which is where the uh, the human sacrifices took place. And maybe it's rather appropriate uh, in the case of uh, Vex Temple that at the top of the 
pyramid in Tenochtitlan, uh, they sacrificed to the god uh, Quetzalcoatl uh, to prevent the coming of the end of the world. Well, of course, the god is actually situated at the top of the temple, the god here being Vivek. And I just want to, as we're getting into Vivek, and I will go on this topic and extend it, um, go into far more depth, I just want to read uh, from Kirkbride, which is the 25th sermon of the 36 uh, sermons of Vivek, the scripture of uh, Vivek City. All cities are born of solid light. Oh, and just another point. All of the reading material that I'm using for the stream is actually found within the books, which are part of the law within universe. I, you can go to a bookstore in Morrowind. You can go to the uh, the great sort of uh, library um, under the uh, the sort of temple administration in Vivek. Uh, you can even find uh, secret libraries where prescribed and censored information is found. Um, and indeed, there is so much law in Morrowind, which was, I believe, deliberately dialed back or simply uh, reproduced and copied uh, for the later stories. Uh, because reading, of course, not just in terms of the um, uh, the law, which is accessible and forms a fundamental part of the story, um, but also the fact that dialogue uh, is written and not recorded. Um, reading is an essential component for Morrowind, which is why a lot of casual players are put off. Um, but anyway, going back to uh, Vivek and the scripture of the city, according to Vivek himself, uh, Vivek, the god of the tribunal. All cities are born of solid light, such as my city, his city. But then the light subsides, revealing the bright and terrible angel of Veloth. His is pure chimerical form, demonic Vec, gaunt and pale and beautiful, skin stretched painfully thin on bird's bones, feathered serpents encircled his arms, again feathered serpents, another very obvious Aztec inspir inspiration. His wings are spread out behind him, their red and yellow ends like razors in the sun. The wispy mass of his fire hair floats as if underwater, milky in the nimbus of light that crowns his head. His presence is undeniable, the awe too much to bear. This is God's city, different from others. Cities from foreign countries put their denizens to sleep and walk to the star-wounded east. That's a reference to the uh, the Red Mountain, to pay homage to me, the capital of the northern men, crusty with one's aeon's ice, bows before Vivek, the city, me it together. And of course, the religious significance as a site of pilgrimage, of course, is um, associated with any number of cities. But uh, you can say that this is the closest we have, uh, alongside with the city of Mournhold, is to Amalexia, um, the Jerusalem of the Dunmeri people, and the primacy of the city as an extension of the god himself, where the gods themselves dwell. Self-thought streets rush through, the rush through tunnel blood. I have rebuilt myself. Hyper-eyed signposts along my traffic arm, soon to be an inner sea. My body is crawling with all gathered to see, me rising up like a monolithic instrument of pleasure. My spine is the main road to the city that I am. Countless transactions are taking place in veins and catwalks, and the roaming, roaming, roaming as they roam, as they roam and through and add to me. They are temples erected along the hollow of my skull, and I will ever wear them as a crown. Walk across the lips of God. They add new doors to me, and I become effortlessly trans-immortal with the comings and goings and the stride heat of the market where I am traded for. Yet all the children hear them play, scoffed at, amused, desired, paid for in the native coin, new minted with my face one side and my city body on the other. I stare with each new wi a window, soon am I a million-eyed insects dreaming. Red sparking war trumpets sound like cattle in the ribcage of shuffling transit. The heretics are destroyed of the plaza knees. I flood over into the hills, houses rising like a rash, and I never scratch. Cities are the antidotes to hunting. I raise lanterns to light my hollows, lend wax to the thousands, the candlesticks that bear my name again and again, the name innumerable shutting in, mantra and priest, God city, filling every corner with naming name, wheeled, circling, running river language, giggling with footfalls, mating, selling, stealing, searching, and worry not ye who walk with me, this is the flowering scheme of the Albrus, this is the promise of image, man, God city, state, I serve and am served, I am made of wire and string and mortar, and I exceed my own precedent, without world without am. So you can say in terms of, again, looking at the particularness of 
Dunmary and Chima civilization, that all of this is wedded to the land. There is a spiritual, um, there is a deistic component with wedding the city, wedding these sort of greater crab uh, structures, uh, the great sort of houses of Sage of Mora. Uh, they are a reflection of the civilization themselves. They are emanating uh, the culture, uh, the disposition of their owners. Uh, this isn't simply something which can be attributed to Vivek as uh, Kirkbride elucidates here, but it's something which is typified for all of Morrowind. Um, the, you, again, as Resdane, was founded and became part of the civilization due to a prophecy. Um, there is a fundamentally religious component to being vested to the land. And of course, this should go some way in terms of being able to ex explain uh, the perception of the Dunma uh, towards outlanders and the effects of colonizing this land, uh, which they believe every sort of element of which is sacred. It is part of um, an extension of the gods they worship themselves. But moving on uh, from the city of Vivek, which again uh, is it, its architecture is um, megalomaniacal, um, as it is indicative of Vivek himself. It borrows elements of the ziggurats, the uh, Mesoamerican structures, uh, the great sort of religious temples of the ancient world. Um, and contrast to this, uh, we have the sort of more uh, typical settlements, the settlements which don't have these uh, high law concepts or these uh, associations uh, with uh, religious significance, uh, which is, I would say, the most uh, earthly of all the houses, um, which is the, of the great houses, which is that of House Halalu. Uh, on the bottom left here, uh, we see an image or concept art of what would ultimately become uh, the city of Balmora. And as you can see, the city of Balmora could be sort of any Middle Eastern or sort of Northern Indian uh, town. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, something that caught my eye in particular is that through uh, the, ci the city centre and the outskirts of the city of Balmora um, are these uh, great towers. And having sort of been to Syria, I was uh, woken to this idea of the uh, the great Ayyubid tower minarets, um, in particular the image we see in uh, here is Aleppo. Uh, so very much there is a sort of medieval Middle Eastern uh, inspiration behind the uh, the most um, down to earth and secularized um, of all the uh, the great houses and that is represented by their arc um, in terms of their architecture. Uh, but despite being far more typical and low fantasy, uh, House Halalu is nevertheless indebted um, to history as we see here. And the most typical of all in terms of the inspirations is the image on the bottom right, which is that of uh, the city of Pelagiad. Uh, combined to Pelagiad, we have the city of Caldera, we have the various legion forts, and we have the imperial capital of Morrowind, which is the city of Ebenhard, uh, which is really a form of great city, uh, really a, it's a, a great medieval citadel. Uh, it is the site of the, uh, the East India, the East Empire Trading Company. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to look at the uh, the inspirations uh, behind the East Empire Company. I'm sure everyone in the chat, I don't need to say anything. But nevertheless, um, there is a commercial and there is a colonial enterprise which is emanating out as a result of the armistice, uh, whereby the tribunal with Vivek reluctantly acceded to becoming uh, part of the empire uh, at that time headed by uh, Tiber Septim who would later become the uh, the man god as part of the uh, the imperial cult, the nine divines, uh, that of Talos. Uh, but as you can see by their architecture, uh, Pelagiad is very much typical of a late medieval, uh, early modern city. I think if I'm going to criticize uh, certain elements of the world building in the Elder Scrolls, uh, this isn't something which you can really um, attribute to Morrowind, uh, is that the Empire and the Imperials, I would say, are very uh, derivative in, in one respect in terms of representing Roman culture. I mean, the legionaries are just Roman centurions. Uh, their names uh, are effectively just uh, Latin inheritance. I mean, I mean that's universal. I don't think there are really any exceptions to that rule. Uh, the Septim dynasty are clearly the Roman emperors. 
um, and even looking at their architecture, you can say this, this is some form of alternative history uh, where the Romans persisted uh, into uh, medieval Europe. Um, but nevertheless, what the empire does serve in terms of the creative world building is a real clash of aesthetics. Uh, looking at the you can say the naturalistic structures, the great Mesoamerican ziggurats, um, and then looking at the sort of more Middle Eastern inspired Balmora, uh, when one comes to the the great sort of garrison forts, uh, Caldera, Pelagia, and Ebenhart, uh, it is so obvious to anyone playing that these are the settlements, these are the forces of the occupiers. Um, and I'll get into that in more depth later on. So I think I've Hopefully, uh, unless anyone wants to, to talk, uh, uh, me to talk about something else, I've uh, gone over the um, aesthetics and the inspiration behind the cities um, in quite a lot of depth. Um, of course, I should not mention that uh, not all of the cities uh, are representative of this. You have incredibly poor uh, shanty towns uh, dotted throughout um, Morrowind, uh, like um, Kool and um, uh, Narmok. And even Sage of Mora, uh, which is the tutorial town uh, where you're essentially let loose, uh, having arrived as a prisoner and uh, let out from the uh, uh, the customs and uh, census office. Um, and again, this goes some way in terms of building the world, in terms of explaining that there isn't simply a sort of wealthy strata. There is extreme poverty in Morrowind, but there is also extreme wealth. The other example of that in terms of extreme wealth uh, would be represented by the um, the Dren plantation, um, areas such as the pleasure city of Suran, and indeed the um, the Escadian islands uh, more generally. Um, and I'll get into the Ashlanders uh, towards the end when in terms of um, building up the factions. Right. So having gone over uh, Velofi and uh, Dunmeri civilization, uh, I have to come to the Amsavi, uh, the tribunal, uh, the gods of Morrowind, because N Nerevar is a symptom of this. But as I said at the beginning, Morrowind is a good Adamarung. It is the twilight of the gods and the gods of the Dunmeri people who really made Dunmeri civilization after they were transformed from the Chima uh, into the Dunmeri are the Amsavi, of the tribunal. I've already mentioned Pavek, but the origin point of this story comes out of the War of the First Council and the Battle for Red Mountain. Here I'm going back to the law books which are found within the game of Morrowind. And a running feature throughout all of these books is that I'm going to be mentioning several different perspectives. There are authors within the context of the story. These aren't simply law books being dumped um, with the uh, omnipotent, uh, sorry, the omniscient understanding uh, of the writers of the games. No, these books are told from the various perspectives. So the first book I'm going to be reading is an imperial perspective. Then I'll be coming back to Vivek's perspective. And all of these writers have either limited knowledge or they're trying to um, insert a certain narrative in terms of their works. And part of the greater story of Morrowind is being able to dissect and deduce some sort of uh, verisimilitude when it comes to uh, throwing all the lore at you. And indeed, this is something in which Morrowind excels uh, which all the later games uh, really fail to do. I think going from the the richness, the story of the tribunal, and then coming to the story of Tiber Septim and Oblivion is really obvious. And what began, as you can say, I mean, I'm talking, what I'm talking about is reading history into Morrowind, where you read into Morrowind's own history within the context of the sources that you are provided. Um, to, be, to get into Morrowind, maybe this is uh, giving away why I love the game so much. Getting into Morrowind, you have to become your own historian. Uh, you have to deal with the source material, and you have to be able to discern the facts and come up with something which is uh, in many ways convincing based on all of these uh, competing interpretations. And no other Elder Scrolls game, I believe, um, really comes that close in terms of being able to um, put that level of trust uh, and investment in terms of the player immersing themselves in this world and trying to make sense of it. But the first account here I have is that of the book, The War of the First Council. 
The War of the First Council was a first age religious conflict between the secular Dunma, Houses Dwema and Dagoth, and the Orthodox Dunma, House Inderil, Redoran, Drez, Halalu, and Telvani. And those houses are the great houses of Morrowind, uh, which make up the great houses up until the destruction of the houses um, in the beginning of the fourth era, which is after the game of Morrowind. The First Council was the first pan dumma governing body, which collapsed over disputes and sources and enchantments practiced by the Dwemer and declared profane by the other houses. So again, what we're talking about is unity, uh, contrast with disunity. The Chima civilization broke away as a result of schism, and schism is a constant feature uh, running throughout civilization. There is always a weak center. Uh, seldom is there one great unifying figure, with the exception of Nerevar and even the tribunal gods, uh, who are able to um, marshal all the forces of Vardenfell and, by extension, all of Morrowind into some sort of centralized regime. And I'll be able to talk about that in a lot more depth when I come to the political superstructure. So going on from here. The secular houses, less numerous but politically and magically more advanced, and aided by Nord and Orc clans, drawn by a promise of land and booty, initially campaigned with great success in the north of Morrowind and occupied much of the land now comprising Redoran, Vardenfell, and the Telvani districts. The Orthodox houses, widely dispersed and poorly organized, suffered defeat after defeat until Nerevar was made general of all house troops and levies. This is the origin of Hortator. Um, Nerevar is one of those exceptional cases where the houses put aside their differences and they invest their political authority in terms of creating a uh, a great arcing general, a high king, a generalissimo. Uh, in terms of my American audience, you can even say that this represents some sort of George Washington character acting as the first president of the quote unquote United States. Uh, but I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, which is actually to talk about the orcs, because I may forget to talk about this later. Um, the orcs are really, you can say, a parallel uh, to the Dun Mary, and I haven't actually heard this perspective um, uh, uh, put elsewhere, but the Orcs, if any way, in many ways, represent a far more diminutive version of what the Dun Mary people could be. Uh, the Dunma, like I said, were a civilization effectively spawned as a result of um, Boethius intervention, and you can say that they were the dupes of uh, Daedric connivance, taking them away from the Somerset Isles. Um, but as Trinamac, um, essentially gave way to Malakath. Um, Malakath, being the Daedric god of the spurned and one of the four corners of the House of Troubles, is the patron god of the orcs. And despite the Dunmeri people being able to establish a province and a civilization, a very powerful and rich civilization, uh, the orcs uh, are never able to form a province uh, in the sort of conventional sense of Tamriel. They have various Orsiniums, all of which fail. And that could be said due to their dependence on Malakath. The stronger they get, the more independent they become. Uh, you can say Malakath actually works against the interests of the Orcs in terms of creating a level of total dependence on him. So the Dunmeri, despite their worship of Daedra, are able to avoid a situation where they are essentially nothing more uh, than the vassals of one of the Daedric gods. Um, and again in terms of um, the perils of associating with Daedra, um, the fact that they have their own agendas and they are amoral at best. Um, I think Malakath is rightly spurned uh, by the Dhamma in terms of their ability to perceive him as a malicious actor um, and of course the Orcs fail to realize that and so when it comes to some sort of deliverance from the horrific Orcish predicament, um, it say for example comes through service to the Legion so continuing on, Nerevar secured the aid of the nomad barbarian tribesmen and contrived to force a major battle at the secular stronghold of Red Mountain on Vardenfell. The secular forces were outmaneuvered and defeated with the help of the Ashlander scouts and the survivors forced to take refuge in the Dwemer stronghold at Red Mountain. After a, brief after a brief siege, treason permitted Nerevar and his troops to enter the stronghold where the secular leaders were slain and Nerevar mortally wounded. General slaughter followed, and the houses Dwemer and Dagoth were exterminated. Nerevar died shortly thereafter of his wounds. Three of Nerevar's associates among the house of the Orthodox houses, Vivek, Almalexia, and Sovasil, succeeded to control the recreated First Council, renamed the Grand Council of Morrowind, and went on to become the god kings and immortal rulers of Morrowind, known as the Tribunal Amsevi. This is the 
conventional imperial attitude, them becoming colonizers and conquerors of this uh, of this completely foreign land. And this is their attempt in terms of being able to understand um, the situation in Vardenfell, hence the rather odd terminology when it comes to the use of words such as uh, secular and orthodox, whatever that means, especially when one looks at the orthodox houses. What does orthodox mean? Does orthodox mean adherence to the uh, the will of the good Daedra? Well, what happens? Vivek, Almalexia, and Sovacil, um usurp the position of the good Daedra, which is a uh, the aspect which defines the uh, the twilight of them as gods. Contrasting this, this is Vivek's official account, which is Sermon 36 from uh, Kirkbride's 36 Lessons of Vivek. For these were the days of Resdania, when Chima and Dwemer lived under the wise and benevolent rule of the Amsavi and their champion, the Hortator, though the Dwemer had become foolish and challenged their masters. Now this, within the context of the history of Velofi civilization is completely absurd, and this is intentional. This is a means of being able to project the power of the tribunal, the Amsavi, further into history than can possibly be claimed. Indeed, if you look further into the 36 lessons, Nerevar, in reference to Vivek, Nerevar, who is very much the generalissimo and superior to Vivek, um, if we're going to take a more objective uh, perspective here, which is helped more so by the imperial perspective, uh, in the 36 lessons, uh, Vivek is always shown to be the master the superior to Nerevar. Nerevar within the uh, tribunal order is a saint, but Vivek is a god. So necessarily in terms of perpetuating the rule of the tribunal, uh, Nerevar must form a lesser role, an essential role, a role which is uh, worthy of emulation, but nevertheless nessa, lesser in terms of being able to justify that the Amsavi were able to take over because they were already in power, which of course they were not. Hence this, uh, again, false narrative that the Dwemer had become foolish and challenged their masters. The, the, the absurdity of the idea that Sovacil, Amalexia, and Vivek were essentially the lords of the Dwemer, and the Dwemers were engaged in an act of treason, as opposed to being a parallel civilization which the imperial count attests to. And again, looking at the Amsavi and their champion as being Nerevar as Hortator, rather than Nerevar essentially presiding over them. Out of their fortresses, they came with golden ballistae that walked and mighty atronarchs and things that spat flame and things that made killing songs. Their king was Dumak, dwarf orc, but their high priest was Kagranak the blighter. Um, again, from what I understand of the uh, the law, uh, Dumak, uh, dwarf orc, again, seems a pejorative in terms of demeaning uh, the Duema civilization, but and again, the idea of uh, Kagranak, the blighter, as opposed to Kagranak essentially being an impartial actor in this. But again, Kagranak is an analogy to, you can say, the perversion of science, um, what the unlimited and unfettered pursuit of knowledge will ultimately give you. Under mountains and over them, the war with the Dwemels raged, and then came the northern men to help Kagranak, and they brought Ismir again. So the association with the Battle of Red Mountain is that the forces of Resdane, under the rule of the Amsavi, which had not yet created their rule, but like I said, this is retroactive history to justify their rule in the future, are seen as the heroes resisting a foreign invasion and a force of uh, domestic uh, subversives, which is that of the Dwemer. Leading the armies of the Chima was the slave that would not perish, the Hortator, Nerevar, who had traded his axe for the ethos knife. He slew Dumak at Red Mountain and saw the heart bone for the first time. The heart bone is the heart of Lorcon. A consistent theme throughout Elder Scrolls lore, um, because there isn't a, it's not monotheistic. It's not like Lord of the Rings where everything comes back to Eru Iluvatar. The universe is essentially created or known is created as a result of an act of deception, uh, which is why the High Elves are so bitter uh, towards their presence on them. Um, they believe essentially they should return to Aetherius, uh, and indeed the Aedra in many ways are condemned to dwell in Nern as the ancestors of the Nern dwellers because they helped create the world. But the original inspiration behind the creation of the world weren't the Aedra, but Lorcan. 
And Lorcan, you can say in terms of weaving this back into Gnostic theology, um, Gnostic essentially being the uh, the various uh, knowledge cults uh, which surrounded uh, uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and uh, preceded the rise of Islam. So we have a cult such as uh, Manichaeanism, probably the being the most successful of the uh, the pre-Islamic Gnostic cults. Um, Gnosticism associate this idea of God and the Demiurge. The Demiurge is a creator, but the world is in many ways some sort of false idol, which is um, essentially uh, there to prevent the emergence of light. Light here is very clearly the light of Aetherius, and indeed Mundus, the sun in this universe, is actually a god who had turned away from the creation of Nern and had essentially gone back to Aetherius. And so the light that comes from the sun is actually the light streaming in from Aetherius. So within the, essentially the context of the Elder Scrolls world, Lorcon is the great demiurge. Um, he is the creator of this fake civilization, uh, which he created through um, foul means and, primal, and uh, fundamentally through treachery. And as a result of his treachery, uh, he was slain, quote unquote, by the other gods. But of course, because he's a god, he couldn't truly uh, fall. There are other inspirations in terms of uh, uh, going back to this with um, uh, with Kronos. And uh, someone is mentioning uh, the dualist, dualistic conception. I will get more into dualism later on. But Gnosticism and the Demiurge aren't just a feature represented through the figure of Lorcon, but fascinatingly in terms of compounding all of these themes are represented within the form of the tribunal themselves they are a demiurge which is dependent on a older a greater demiurge which is that of Lorcon and it is through the heart of Lorcon that they are able to usurp the powers of a god and attain a form of immortality um, it is through their association with the heart bone uh, that they're able to rule over the Dunmeri people as gods so continuing on Men of brass destroyed the elven gates of Morninghold, Mornhold, and behind them came the Dwemer architects of Tone. A.M. A.M. is a, not A.M. is an A.M., but A.Y.E.M. Uh, is a pseudonym that Kirkbride uses uh, for Almalexia. Threw down her cloak <clears throat> and became the face-snicked queen of the three-in-one, the three-in-one, the triad of the tribunal, uh, represented by the uh, the martial prowess of Almalexia, uh, who is an aspect or the anticipation of Almalexia was Boethia, uh, the god king of the original um, Chima. Those that looked upon her were overcome by the meanings of the stars. Under the sea, Set, which is a uh, pseudonym for Sophocil, stirred, and Sophocil is essentially the Dunmo response to the Dwemer. Uh, he is a great inventor. Uh, he is the source of wisdom among the tribunal. Um, if Almalexia is to represent strength, and Vivek is essentially there to represent intrigue. Set stirred and brought the army he had been working on in the castles of glass and coal. Clockwork droves, mockeries, the Dwemi and Dremeri war machines rose up from the seas and took their counterparts back beneath, where they swallowed forever by the sea. Red Mountain exploded as the Hortator went far, far inside, seeking the Sharmat. The Sharmat is essentially a uh, iteration of Degofur. Indeed, you can say that the personification of the demonization of Degofur to become the Sharmat, um, the other, um, again, you can say represents the uh, transition from Melkor becoming Morgoth. Dwemeri High Priest Kagranak then revealed that, and again, a uh, high priest, um, the Dwemer had no religious structure. Um, it wasn't that they were atheists because the gods are clearly real in the context of the Elder Scrolls universe. Um, but essentially Kagranak is, an, is a tonal architect. He wasn't a high priest, but in terms of creating some sort of great religious battle, uh, Vivek is very convenient for him to see this as a contest of religious ideology, but of course the Dwemer spurned all such concepts. Dwemeri high priest Kagranak then revealed that which he had built in the image of Vivek. <laughs> <laughs> Again, in the image of Avec. It's it's wonderful reading this because you can imagine that uh, 
uh, I think it was Kirk Bright who, yeah, so this is Kirk Bright, um, had so much fun in terms of being able to weave an intentionally false narrative in terms of being the uh, the self-serving uh, raison d'etre for the power of Vec as um, essentially having always existed as a god. Um, and of course, the image of a Vec here is the, uh, the great sort of mechanical monstrosity, which is the Nemidium. It was a walking star which burned the armies of the triune, the, tri the tribunal, and destroyed the heartland of Veloth, creating the inner sea. And in terms of a, another uh, Lord of the Rings Silmarillion uh, inspiration, uh, it is clear uh, that the creation of the inner sea separating Vardenfell from Morrowind uh, is an allusion to the destruction of Beleriand. Um, and indeed, that is going to echo forward with the creation um, of the uh, of the red year uh, typifying the fourth age each of the aspects of the arms of e then rose up together coming combining as one and showed the world the sixth path am took from the star its fire set took from it its mystery and vec the pseudonym for vivek took from its feet which had been constructed before with the gift of Molag Baal and destroyed in the manner of truth by a great hammering. When the soul of the Dwemer could walk no more, they were removed from this world. Resdania was no more. It had been redeemed of all the iniquities of the foolish. The Armsavi drew nets from the beginning palace and captured the ash of Red Mountain, which they knew as the blight of the Dwemer, and they would serve only to infect the whole of the middle world and ate it. Now, there is a lot to sort of um, read into that. The idea that Red Mountain was captured, which represented the blight of the Dwemer. Um, if anything, you can say that this feeds into the idea of the return of the blight, essentially representing that of the original sort of corruption that the Dwemer exposed with their um, uh, original act of quote unquote treason to the arms of e. uh, But through the course of Morrowind, actually, this is in the course of the um, uh, the Major's Guild storyline, uh, you're able to piece together what happened to the Dwemer. And essentially what happened to Kagranak is that the, as far as I'm aware, um, the dwarves um, essentially became disappeared and they became attached to the, um, the man-made god, um, the Numidium. Uh, so this idea essentially um, that the Dwemer were defeated and then removed as if there were some uh, great act of um, divine retribution. Again, there's a very convenient uh, story here for Vivek to, um, to justify in terms of the demise of the Dwemer, the destruction of the Numidium. And of course, the Numidium wasn't destroyed. Uh, the Numidium was removed. It was later found in elsewhere the province of the Khajiit, um, these desert dwelling cat people, and used as a tool to conquer Nern under the Aegis of the Tiber Septim dynasty. And the great irony here is that Tiber Septim was able to subdue the tribunal, if anything, undoing the legacy of Red Mountain with some respect in terms of creating some sort of greater civilizational state under the rule of the god of the god kings and then having that uh, same legacy of the power of the uh, the great uh, Dem Duomo monstrosity coming back and uh, subduing uh, the Dunmeri civilization regardless. So that is the official account that the god king Vivek would want you to know. But then we have his true feelings on the matter, again, representing the, the multifaceted nature in terms of the storytelling, uh, the split within Vivek's personality and the actual aesthetic here uh, is that Vivek himself is half Dunmeri and half Chimor, uh, blue and golden. Uh, if anything, he represents the inner conflict, um, which is at the root of the new Dunmeri civilization. And this is, the book is the, uh, actually, no, I've, I've, I've gone a bit too far, sorry. Um, before I get to that, um, I just want to read from a segment called The Anticipations. So, in the 36th lessons, which lead to the 36th lesson, which is the dominion of the Amsavi and the defeat of the Dwemer, uh, we have the formal creation of the anticipations. So this is the formalization of the religious and historical revisionism, which underpins the new order created by the tribunal. 
The Daedra are powerful ancestor spirits, similar in form and substance to the tribunal. Blessed be their holy names, but weaker in power and more arbitrary and removed from the affairs of mortals. In old times, the Chima worshipped the Daedra as gods. But they did not deserve this veneration, for the Daedra harmed their worshippers as often as they helped them. The advent of the tribunal, blessed be their holy name, changed this unhappy state. By the apotheosis, the tribunal, blessed be their holy name, became the protectors and high ancestor spirits, the Dunma, and bade the Daedra to give proper veneration and obedience. The three good Daedra, Boethia, Azura, and Mafala, recognized the divinity of the triune ancestors, blessed be their holy names. The rebel Daedra, Molag Baal, Malakaf, Sher Gorof, and Merons Dagon, refused to swear fealty to the tribunal, blessed be their holy names, and their worshippers were cast out. These rebel Daedra, a Daedra thus became the four corners of the House of Troubles, and they continued to plague our tranquility and tempt the unwary into heresy and dark worship. The priests of the temple remain ever vigilant for signs of the adversary's return, sometimes aided by the loyal three good Daedra, who are familiar with the wiles of their rebellious kin. The good Daedra are known to the temple as the Anticipations, since they are early ancestral anticipation, uh, anticipations of the loving patronage of the tribunal. So the official theology, the official sort of religious article or creed, of the tribunal arms of East state over Dunma, of, over the Dunmary, over Morrowind, post Resdane, is to recontextualize Velof's original journey. Velof split from the Aldmeri in terms of being able to create a new civilization which was devoted to Daedra worship. Now, with the advent of the arms of East, the new gods, the Daedra have now simply become weaker vessels they have become the anticipations the tribunal essentially were there they're, they're essentially you can say a form of trinitarian worship in more senses than one it's not just the triad of the three gods a preceding trinity but they are the redeemers the prophet the prophesized ones um the gods essentially that were the final fruition of velof's original promise to form a new land um and again, that is a very convenient tale. Uh, it's also a very, it's a brilliant way in terms of being able to justify a fantasy legitimation of a, of a certain religious order um, in terms of taking the original inspiration for the creation of the Chima civilization, the Daedra, and then using them simply as the precursors to the true gods, what everything has been leading up to. Um, but of course, this is a lie. And it's compounded within this account by saying that the new Daedra essentially offered their vassalage uh, to the uh, to the new Amsavi, uh, which is completely untrue. There was no incentive um, for the Daedra um, essentially to offer fealty. Rather, what happened is that when the Amsavi mantled these previous gods, the influence of these gods, uh, with the exception um, really of Boethia, who was essentially sort of eradicated. Um, sorry, the in the sorry Azura and uh, Mafala, very much the case with Boethia, um, their influence within the world decreased. And as is the case with the Elder Scrolls, um, once the worship of a particular entity decreases, so their power decreases, so they supplanted and they usurped the power of the original Daedra. They didn't represent some sort of divinely sanctioned passing of the torch, which is the um, impression given here. And again, just to give more credence to this idea of the beautiful world building here, which is the continual reference to blessed be their holy name. And again, emblematic of um, the Islamic veneration of um, there is one God and Muhammad is his prophet, blessed be his name. Um, so that is the formal legitimation. So where does it come to the actual um, inspiration, the historical inspiration behind the individual characters of the Amsavi, having established their law purpose within the context of Morrowind. Well, obviously, we come to the heart of Lorcan and the tribunal, as I've already mentioned, representing um, a demiurge, a form of a false god, which is obscuring the true reality. In the case of Lorcan, 
Lawcon is the demiurge before Aetherius, and the tribunal are the demiurge in the context of the Daedra. Uh, going back to the original story of Moses, which I believe inspired the passage of Veloth, uh, we have, of course, the creation of the golden idol. The golden idol, which um, is formed in Moses' absence, then Moses comes, the golden idol is destroyed, and the true religion under the new commandments is restored through the worship of Yahweh. So we have the anticipations which fueled the original pilgrim at the original um passing of the jews and then we have the creation of a golden bull and then we have the reclamations of the daedra destroying that golden bull so the golden idol is clearly an inspiration in terms of the um the interregnum of the tribunal between the anticipations and the reclamations of the daedra in terms of more superficial comparisons um moving on from moses uh shiva the Hindu goddess god uh, seems very much, um, at least aesthetically, in terms of personality, uh, linked to the character of Almalexia, or Am, as uh, Kirk Bride has referred to her as. And then we have Vishnu, Vishnu, which is very clearly Vivek or Vek. And I would possibly say Ganesh is the closest Indian comparison or Hindu comparison um, we have to Sofasil. Uh, who was also known as Set. But in terms of a clear inspiration, so I've already mentioned Gnosticism, I've mentioned Hinduism, uh, but there are clearly Egyptian inspirations. And I believe this comes back to Kirkbride's uh, fundamental esotericism, uh, which is indebted to one Aleister Crowley. Um, within the context of the Elder Scrolls civilization, we have the original force of chaos, which is Padme, and we have Siphis, which represents the eternal void. I think this goes back to Crowley and his inspiration behind uh, Nuit, um, who is the foundational god of the universe, who represents a feminized version, essentially, of the eternal night. Um, but going from Crowley again, Crowley's... Um, esoteric uh, sort of uh, essentially a uh, counter religion or telema um very much attempts to create a new sort of set of gods uh, which have very much egyptian connotations which is why i believe when kirk bride was taking the inspiration of the tribunal and contextualizing them within the 36 lessons almalexia becomes am vivek becomes vec and so Vasil becomes set which are clearly egyptian in terms of the various uh, uh linguistic illusions that they come back um and again you have um the the more sort of um, crazy law elements such as Vivek, the birth of the god from the Nechman's wife, Vivek essentially being born of an egg. And in terms of creating, finding the more sort of insane law inspirations behind Vivek, um, Vivek to me is very reminiscent of Alexander the Great, and I'll explain why. Alexander was the son of Olympias. Olympias was the queen of Macedon. And she was rumored to have a orgiistic relationship with snakes. Having essentially been bequeathed from Olympias and the routine association with treachery and snakes um, associated with the conception of Alexander, we go from Alexander becoming king of Macedon. He then goes to Egypt and he becomes Zeus Ammon. He proclaims himself a god, a god over the people of Egypt, and this substantiates his rule. And this, to me, is very clearly emblematic of Vivek becoming a god-king, um, essentially over the Dunmeri people. Rather, it was a conscious political decision. And linking back to um, Olympias, we come to the stories of Vivek mating with a dro and Molag Baal, um, the god of rape, and spawning various horrific creatures of, you can say, emblematic of Greek mythology, which would be the great monsters, which you can say refer to the, um, the Greek association with the Gigantes or Poseidon and the Cyclops, etc. Um, these are, you can say, eternal stories or sort of uh, comparative, um, when it comes to comparative mythology, um, the associations with particular um, creatures and the primordial giants and the slaying of monsters and that being the typical aspect of the uh, the quintessential hero. So that's Vivek, clearly I believe inspired by Alexander the Great um, and the political implications thereof of creating a god king. And then we come to Almalexia, Almalexia, the uh, the face snaked queen, 
who, going back to the Aztec inspirations for Morrowind, is clearly an aspect of Quetzalcoatl. Yet the analogy to Quetzalcoatl isn't one for one, because I believe Quetzalcoatl plays a myriad sort of aspect within the story and a contrasting one. You could even say a contradictory one. In terms of the persona and the way Amalexia presents herself, especially in terms of the background law, she is very much Quetzalcoatl, the snake god of war. And that is essentially Amalexia's role within the um, form of the tribunal. However, Quetzalcoatl is also a promise of the end of the world when Quetzalcoatl comes and brings down Aztec civilization. And indeed, the flower wars and the human sacrifice are a way to essentially abate Quetzalcoatl and the coming of the world, which some believed was associated with um, Herman Cortez. And again, the Aztecs, the Spanish, uh, you can say that's term, that could be another inspiration in terms of looking at the alien contrast between the, uh, the Roman-esque uh imperials and the uh dunmary culture and of course if quetzalcoatl is, to, is supposed to represent some sort of um world ending event then quetzalcoatl is also in real world mythology associated with venus the morning star and who inspired who is inspired by venus in the elder scrolls universe azura who is azura essentially the patron of the Nereverine. So Almalexia is Quetzalcoatl, and the Nereverine is also Quetzalcoatl. And how does the tribunal end, essentially, by Almalexia facing off the Nereverine, the two war gods of the Dunmeri people? Now I want to talk about the 36 lessons themselves and where the inspiration comes, because the 36 lessons in terms of the um, iconography um, of Morrowind. I mean, they're essential in terms of uh, the mystique associated with the law. They are the most famous of the books within the context of Morrowind. And I believe I would say the most famous uh, uh, contribution by Michael Kirkbride to the series. Um, but where do the 36 lessons come from? Uh, a lot of people point to the uh, Bhagavad Gita, uh, a essentially a Hindu philosophy book. But I am not convinced by that. I mean, there are other inspirations to the Book of Solomon, but reading this, I can't help but feel that there is an inspiration from Zeus Braxadusustra, uh, thus spoke Zoroaster, uh, which is, of course, uh, Nietzsche's essentially uh, take on the messianic prophecies of Zoroastrianism, um, albeit very much recontextualized within his own philosophy. Um, that's even obvious in terms of the specific style that Kirk Bry uses in terms of a story, and of course, the fundamental philosophy, which I'll get to at the end. But I would say the more prominent example beyond uh, Zeus Brax Zarathustra uh, is going back to Alistair Crowley and to Lema. And uh, as Nietzsche was sort of working in the 1880s, uh, this is sort of Edwardian, uh, typical Western esotericism. And just to prove my point, I want to compare two works. This is Sermon 6 of um, the 36 sermons penned by Vivek. There is an eon within itself when unraveled becomes the first sentence of the world. Mephala and Azura are the twin gates of tradition and Boethia is the secret flame. The sun shall be eaten by lions which cannot be found yet in Veloth. Six are the vests and garments worn by, soup, by suppositions of men, proceed only with the simplest terms, for all others are enemies and will confuse you. Six are the formulas to heaven by violence, one that you have learned by studying these words. The father is a machine and the mouth of a machine. He, his only mystery is an invitation to elaborate further. The mother is active and clawed like a nix hound, yet she is the holiest of those that reclaim their days. The son is myself, Vivek, and I am unto thee three, six, nine, and the rest that came after, glorious and sympathetic, without borders, utmost in the perfections of this world and others, sword and symbol, pale like gold. There is a fourth kind of philosophy that uses nothing but disbelief. For by the sword, I mean the sensible. For by the word, I mean the dead. I am Vec, your protector, and the protector of Red Mountain until the end of days, which are numbered 333. Three. Um, obviously, this could be allusion to the 
Apocalypse of St. John and the numbers 666. Um, I looked up the numbers uh, 3,333, and um, I'm not sure I completely understand it, but there is some association with um, uh, the angels, which, again, could be a conscious decision by Kirk Bry. But in terms of Vec emphasizing his role as the protector of Red Mountain, in terms of being able to understand Vardenfell uh, within the context of Morrowind as a whole, Morrowind is a province, but Vardenfell uh, is a religious preserve. Uh, it is essentially under the direct control, ostensibly, at least in theory, of the tribunal. Uh, it is a sacred island, but what essentially became a passage for the tribunal to renew their powers in Red Mountain through the heart of Lorcon, uh, the religious preserve has, uh, has essentially been recontextualized uh, into a no-go area due to the prevalence of the blight. Uh, it has become a quarantined region. Um, and so you can say Dagoth Ur spurns the, uh, the pretensions of the tribunal by turning their uh, holier site of pilgrimage into a uh, uh, into a dystopian hellhole. So continuing, below me is the savage, which we needed to remove ourselves from the Ultima. Again, linking back to my belief that there was a conscious bar a barbarism associated with the creation of the Chima and de Veloth. Above me is a challenge which bathes itself in fire and the essence of a god. Through me, you are desired, unlike the prophets that have borne your name before. Six are the walking ways from enigma to enemy to teacher. Boethia and Azura are the principles of the universal plot which is begetting, which is creation, and Mephala makes of it an art form. For by the sword, I mean the first knight. For by the word, I mean the dead. There will be a splendor in your name when it is said to be true. Six are the guardians of Veloth, three before they are born again, and they will test you until you have proper tendencies of the hero. There is a world that is sleeping, and you must guard against it. For by the sword, I mean the dual nature. For by the word, I mean animal life. For by the sword, I mean preceded by a sigh. For by the word, I mean preceded by a wolf. The ending words is Armsavi. So take that take the content of that and the style of that and compare it now to the Book of Lords and the idea of the will made manifest versus prophetic determinism. In particular, this is chapter three of the Book of Lords and a uh, section from essentially uh, stanza 60 uh, by Alistair Crowley in the Telema uh, esoteric tradition or religion. There is no law beyond thou what thou wilt. There is an end of the world of the god enthroned in Ra's seat, lightening the girders of the soul. To me, ye reverence, to me come ye through tribulation of ordeal, which is bliss. The fool re readeth in this book of lords and its comments, and he understandeth not. Let him come through the first ordeal, and it will be to him as silver, through the second gold, through the third stones of precious water, through the fourth ultimate sparks of the intimate fire. Yet to all it shall seem beautiful. Its enemies who say not so are mere liars. This is success. I am the hawk-headed lord of silence and of strength. My nemesis shrouds the night's blue sky. Hail, ye twin warriors about the pillars of the world, for your time is nigh at hand. I am the lord of the double wand of power, the wand of the force of the Kaf Niar. But my left hand is empty, for I have crushed a universe and naught remains. Paste the sheets from right to left and from top to bottom. Then behold, there is a splendor in my name, hidden and glorious, as the sun of midnight is ever the sun. The ending of the words is the word Abra Hadabra. So clearly, I mean, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, you look at that and just say that uh, maybe Kurt Bright uh, is responsible for a bit of plagiarism here. Um, but what does this all mean? Well, as with the allusions, I believe, to Zeus Brat uh, this is the core emphasis of the Nietzschean will to power, the law as the work made manifest, the law of necessity. He who saves a nation violates no law. The idea that I am justified because of my victory, essentially, to perpetuate this form of rulership. I have presented my rule through fiat, and there's no greater legitimacy, essentially, than the will. Um, and of course, Underpinning all of this uh, is an aspect of usurpation, going back to the Demiurge. And the most obvious sign 
that this within the law is a sign of usurpation is Azura, the original good Daedra and the anticipation of Sovacil. She turns the golden-skinned Chima and they become the dark-skinned Dunma, the dark elves. And what is this clearly a reference to? The curse of Ham in the Bible. Um, Ham essentially has his skin darkened and the darkening of his skin in the Bible is, of course, the result of a transgression. And what greater transgression can there be against the good Daedra and Asura in particular, in terms of some sort of a supreme hubris, than the desire to usurp the powers and become gods in themselves? So here we have the curse of Ham very clearly referenced in terms of the transition from the Chima to the Dunma. And I do mean Azura and hubris in the pure sort of a Greek mythological sense, um, because hubris is a connotation associated with mortals attempting to supersede that of the gods. Uh, just taking one example, uh, Arachne and Athena, um, Athena being the uh, superlative seamstress, and Arachne not only attempting to uh, to best her, best Athena, but also weaving into her and into her um, tapestries uh, themes of rebellion against the gods. So not so Azura destroys Arachne, but out of some consolation, Azura then transforms Arachne um, into the first spider. So again, in terms of um, you can say. A constant theme through Azura essentially is that, you know, she is not a purely benevolent entity. She is responding to hubris and her prophecies, which form the underpinning of the Nerevarine story and the cult of the Nerevarine, is essentially an attempt to win back power for herself. And this, again, it is not simply the story telling you that the prophecies are true, even though they come true as a result of the story. Um, but rather, the prophecy is a promise by Azura that she will have the last laugh and she will reclaim her authority and she will depose these Gnostic demiurges who have attempted to supplant her as a god. So that is one clear aspect of usurpation which rings through the world building of Morrowind but another is that of the stalemate which is being created between the tribunal and the risen counter god Degoth Ur and so we have this uh, friction this dualistic element wedded into the theology which is essentially that of a con contest between a supposedly a good force represented by the tribunal and an evil force represented by Dagoth Ur. However the story is subverted in a way that both dualistic components are neither holy good or holy evil. Maybe I'll get into that what I mean by Dagoth Ur because Dagoth Ur does have some sort of a nationalistic point to him which is why I'm sort of uh, donning his mantle today for the uh, for the meme value. Um, but we take a traditional dualistic conception between good and evil and Morrowind subverts it and destroys it through the force of the Nereverine. So that is one again clear sign of the perils in paradise and the aspects of usurpation. And how do the Amsavi cope with this? They create a great priesthood of Baal. They create a whole legion as part of their temple. Not only do we have the priestly body of it, uh, but then we have the ordinators. And by extension, we also have the buoyant armagers. Obviously, there are inspirations behind um, the Inquisition and the Crusaders and things like that. But I believe the most obvious comparison is not Christian, but it is to the original priesthood of Baal. The priesthood of Baal who are arguing against the worship of Yahweh. They are subverting the religion through the uh, malign influence of a Jezebel. And what does Elijah do? Elijah essentially showcases that they are essentially in error and the true God of Israel is Yahweh. And in this case, Azura would be Elijah uh, demonstrating that act of usurpation. And the fact that the tribunal had to counteract this uh, lingering element of illegitimacy by relying on a vast legion um, of lies, essentially, um, to buttress their rule. Going back to Churchill, um, the truth must be uh, safeguarded by a uh, <laughs> um, by a uh, by a legion of lies or words to that effect. And of course, that's very appropriate when describing Churchill. But anyway. The most comical aspect, which I've included on the image of the right, the concept art for the Ministry of Truth, is Shea Gorath. 
Sheagorath is the Prince of Madness, and he forms the basis of the Shivering Isles expansion in Oblivion, um, which I believe is the best part of the game Oblivion. But anyway, Sheagorath is consigned by the Tribunal to become one of the Four Corners of the House of Troubles. And what does Sheagorath do? Uh, to mock the pretensions of the tribunal's uh, assumed divinity. They, he throws down a massive rock uh, to destroy uh, Vivek City. But in contesting that, Vivek holds the rock in suspension. But because he is a false god, he cannot deflect or put the rock down. Essentially, the rock is frozen, and the rock has that original momentum from which Sheogorov threw it. So essentially, the rock can only exist in its place until, um, so long as um, the tribunal has the power to keep it in suspended animation. But the minute that that power wanes, the rock will collide into Vivek and destroy it, which is ultimately what happens. Um, but again, it's a beautiful narrative explanation to demonstrate the impending doom of the tribunal, and this being a Goethe Dameron, by showing Sheogorov's response uh, through the rock. And of course, in the final act of irony, uh, what did the temple do with this rock? Uh, they turn it into the Ministry of Truth. Um, they turn it into a holding cell and a, uh, a fortress for the ordinators. So the rock which was created to spurn uh, the pretensions, the tribunal, becomes essentially the uh, the, the dark sort of center of the, um, uh, the tribunal temple religion, uh, the evil side of it. And of course, the Ministry of Truth has obvious Orwellian connotations. So that is the description of the arms of e. But now I, I mentioned this earlier and I preempted it a bit, but I'll come back here. So after all of that, after the creation of the myth of the anticipations and the 36 lessons, we come to the dualistic component of Vivek and we come to his actual thoughts regarding the Battle of Red Mountain, the rise and fall of the tribunal. And this is actually addressed to a dissident priest who has been drawn towards the Nereverine cult. And in contrast to the accounts that we have earlier, one which I mentioned was an imperial law book, um, one which was a sympathetic reading from Vivek himself, and one which was an official dogmatic uh, rich, um, an official doc, um, part of dogma, which is that of the anticipations. Um, this is really the only honest first-hand account of what we have in the universe of the events of the Battle of Red Mountain. And it's going to be the longest segment I read. Who can clearly recall the events of the distant past? But you have asked me to tell you in my own words the events surrounding the Battle of Red Mountain the birth of the tribunal and the prophecies of the Nerevar reborn. Here is what I can tell you, I being Vivek. When the Chima first abandoned the herds and tents of their nomadic ancestors and built the first great houses, we loved the Daedra and worshipped them as gods. But our brethren, the Dwemer, scorned the Daedra and mocked our foolish rituals and preferred instead their gods of reason and logic. So the Chima and Dwemer were always as bitter at bitter war until the Nords came and invaded Resdame. Only then did the Chima and Dwemer put away their strife and join together to cast out the invaders, an alliance of mutual advantage and convenience. And again, his true assessment here um, that the Dwemer didn't represent some sort of a religious collision and they didn't represent some form of um, under authority compared to the arms of E, but rather they represented a parallel authority. Again, the intentional historic public revisionism of Vivek and his true um, historical recollections. Once the Nords were driven out, General Nerevar of the Chima and General Dumak of the Dwemer, again no uh, orc king, uh, who had come to love and respect one another, resolved to make peace between their peoples. 
In that time, I was but a junior counsellor to Nerevar, and Nerevar's queen, Almalexia, as his other favourite counsellor, Sovasil, always doubted that such a peace might long survive, given their bitter disputes between Chima and Dwemer, but by negotiation and compromise, Nerevar and Dumak somehow managed to preserve a fragile peace. So again, inverted from the 36 lessons here, Vivek announces the truth that he, along with the others, uh, were with Almalexia, wife, but with Sovasil, he was but a counsellor. He was never the superior to Nerevar. But when Dagoth Ur, lord of House Dagoth, and trusted as a friend of both Nerevar and the Dwemer, brought us proof that the high engineer Kagranak, again, proper description of the Dwemer, had discovered the heart of Lorcon, and that he had learned how to tap its power, and was building a new god, a mockery of the Chimmer faith, and a fearsome weapon, we all urged Nerevar to make war on the dwarves and to destroy this threat to the Chimmer beliefs and security. Nerevar was troubled. He went to Dumak and asked, what if Dagoth Ur said was true? But Kagranak took great offence and asked, whom Nerevar thought he was, that he might presume to judge the affairs of the Dwemer. So again, going back to this uh, theme of hubris, essentially, the Dwemer are intentionally tempting the Dhamma to intervene. Indeed, you can say they're confident, perhaps rightfully confident, in the superiority of their civilization in every way to the only uh, recently domesticated, formerly um, nomadic, um, barbarous Dunmeri, uh, that having essentially joined together to defeat the greater threat, the Nords, uh, they can now return uh, to complete their plans uh, with the heart of Lorcom. And indeed, at the beginning here, uh, Dagoth Ur, Lord of House Dagoth, which is the sixth house, uh, is represented in neutral uh, neutral words as opposed to the great Shamat or the uh, vilification of him as the Elder Scrolls equivalent of a Morgoth. Nerevar was further troubled and made pilgrimage to Holmayan, the sacred temple of Azura, and Azura confirmed that all that Dagoth uh, had said was indeed true and that the creation of a new god of the Dwemer should be prevented at all costs. When Nerevar came back to us and told us what the goddess had said, we felt our judgments confirmed and again cancelled him to war, chiding Nerevar for his naive trust in friendship and remaining, reminding Nerevar of his duty to protect the faith and security of the Chima against the impiety and dangerous ambitions of the Dwemer. Now, remember these aspects of his civilized and gentle temperament, so I'll come back to them towards the end. Then Nerevar went back to Vardenfell one last time, hoping that negotiations and compromise might once preserve the peace. But this time, the friends Nerevar and Dumak quarrelled bitterly, and as a result, the Chima and Dwemer went to war. The Dwemer were well defended by their fortress at Red Mountain, but Nerevar's cunning drew most of Dumak's armies out into the field and pinned them there, while Nerevar, Dagofor, and a small group of companions could make their way to the heart chamber by secret means. There, Nerevar, the Chima king, again, not just Generalissimo here or Hortator, but king, um, according to Vivek himself, met Dumak, the dwarf king, and they both collapsed from grievous wounds and draining magics. With Dumak fallen and threatened by Dagofu and others, Kagranak turned his tools upon the heart, and Nerevar um, said he saw Kagranak and all his Dwemer companions at once disappear from the world in that instant. Dwemer everywhere disappeared without a trace. But Kagranak's tools remained, and Dagoth Ur seized them, and he carried them to Nerevar, saying, That fool Kagranak has destroyed his own people with these things. We should destroy them right away, lest they fall into the wrong hands. But Nerevar was resolved to confer with his queen and his generals who had forsaken that, this war, foreseen that this war would come, and whose counsel he would not ignore again. I will ask the tribunal, what shall we do with them? For they have had wisdom in the past, and I had not. Stay here, loyal Degofor, until I return. So Nerevar told Degofor to protect the tools in the heart chamber until he returned. Then Nerevar was carried to us, where he waited at the slopes of Red Mountain, and he told us that what had transpired under Red Mountain. What Nerevar had, Nerevar had said was that the Dwemer had used special tools to turn their people into immortals, and that the heart of Lorcan held wondrous powers. After hearing Nerevar, we gave our counsel as he requested, proposing we should preserve these tools in the trust for the welfare of the Chima people. And who knows, perhaps the Dwemer are not gone forever, but merely transported to some distant realm from which they might someday return to threaten our security again. Therefore, we need to keep these tools to study them and their principles so that we may be safe for future generations. 
And though Nerevar voiced his grave misgivings, he was willing to be ruled by our council under one condition, that we all together should swear a solemn oath upon Azura that the tools would never be used in the profane manner that the Duema had intended. We all readily agree agreed and swore solemn oaths at Nerevar's dictation. So then we went with Nerevar back into Red Mountain and met Degofor. Degofor refused to deliver the tools to us, saying they were dangerous and we could not touch them. Degofor seemed to be irrational, insisting that only he could be trusted with the tools. And then we guessed that he had somehow been affected by his handling of the tools. But now I feel sure that he had privately learned of the powers of the tools and had in some way, confused, a confused way, decided that he must have them for himself. Then Nerevar and our guard resorted to force to secure the tools. Somehow, Degofor and his retainers escaped, but when we gained the tools and delivered them to Sofa Sil for study and safekeeping. For some years, we kept the oaths. We swore to Azura with Nerevar, but during that time, in secret, Sofa Sil studied the tools and divined their mysteries. At last, he came to us with a vision of a new world of peace, with justice and honour for nobles, and health and prosperity for commoners, with the tribunal, us, as immortal patrons and guides. And dedicating ourselves to the vision of a better world, we made a pilgrimage to Red Mountain, and transformed ourselves with the power of Kagranak's tools. And no sooner than we had completed our rituals and begun to discover our newfound powers, the Daedra Lord Azura appeared and cursed us, for our forsworn oaths. By her powers of prophecy, she assured us that her champion Nerevar, true to his oath, would return to punish us for our perfidy, and to make sure such profane knowledge might never again be used to mock and defy the will of the gods. But Sophisil said to her, the old gods are cruel and arbitrary, and distant from the hopes, the fears of Myrrh, i.e. The, i.e. the elves, your age is past. We are the new gods, born of flesh, and wise and caring of the needs of our people. Spare us your threats and chiding in constant spirit. We are bold and fresh, and we will not fear you. Again, the Almsavi justifying their rule in terms of strictly political um, means. They have essentially assumed power through force of will, and they will make manifest their divinity through the great work, that being them investing in the spiritual and political welfare of Vardenfeld, then by extension, all Morrowind. In that moment, all Chima were changed into Dwemer, and our skins turned ashen and our eyes into fire. Of course, we only knew at the time that this had happened to us, but Azura said, this is not my act, but your act. You have chosen your fate, and the fate of your people and all the Dhamma shall share your fate. From now to the end of time, you think yourselves gods, but you are blind, and all is darkness. The new world we shaped was glorious and generous, and the worship of the Dunma fervent and grateful. The Duema were at first afraid of their new faces, but Sofa Sil spoke to them, saying that it was not a curse but a blessing, a sign of their changed natures, and a sign of their special favour that they might enjoy as new men, no longer barbarians, trembling before ghosts and spirits, but civilised myrrh, speaking directly to their immortal friends and patrons, the three faces of the tribunal. And we were all inspired by Sophisil's speech and vision and took heart. And over time, we crafted the customs and institutions of a just and honourable society. And the land of Resdane knew millennia of peace, equity and prosperity unknown to the other savage races. But beneath Red Mountain, Dagoth Ur had survived. And even as the light of our bold new world shined ever more brightly, beneath Red Mountain, the darkness gathered. A darkness that was close kin to the bright light that saved the sill coaxed from the heart of Lorcan with the tools of Kagranak. As darkness grew, we fought it and crafted walls to confine it, but we never could destroy it, for the source of darkness was the same source as the source of our own divine inspiration. And in later days of Morrowind, reduced to a subjugated province, the Western Empire, as the glory of the temple fades and the dark tide rises from Red Mountain. We are reminded of Azura and her promised champion's return. We have waited blind and in darkness, mere shadows drained of our ardent vision. In shame of our folly, in fear of our judgment and in hope of our deliverance. We do not know if the outlander claiming to fulfill the prophecies the Nerevarine is our old companion. This in the context of the beginning of the game of Morrowind. Nerevar reborn or a pawn of the emperor or a cat's paw of Azura or some twist of fate. But we insist you adhere to temple doctrine and conform to the strictures dividing the hierographer from the aporographer, and that you do not speak them, that you must only be, that 
which must not be spoken openly. Act as a dutiful priest should in accordance with your vows of obedience and the canons and arch canons, and all will be forgiven. Defy me and you will know what it is to stand against a god. There is an aspect of fatalism, defeatism creeping into Vivek's thought. He is wise. He is clearly aware of the fate that has befallen the tribunal and essentially of their impending doom. And he indeed is willing to entertain the prospect that Nereverine may have in fact returned to Vardenfell, though he is rightly cautious of the fact that it may be some sort of cat's paw or some sort of um, contrivance or subversion as a result of the quote unquote subjugation by the Western Empire. Um, but again, all of this goes to indicate that despite this, he's not prepared to willingly surrender his power and all the arms that we have created and demands of the priests of the tribunal temple, outward conformity, even though the faith, the inner fire, the belief behind the uh, world the tribunal have attempted to build is fading. And indeed, as Degov Ur had survived, as the empire being able to subjugate Morrowind, all the promises, all the glory that came associated with the arms of the in the era and the uh, the sort of uh, early years of the second era, uh, is now becoming undone. It's becoming more obvious uh, that the arms of the are decaying. They are facing their twilight as gods. Uh, yet they will still not go not go down fighting. And this is also a a um, foreshadowing of how the individual members of the arms of the tribunal are going to reckon with this fate that Vivek has been able to elucidate here. Vivek undergoes, you can say, a sort of pragmatic form of... Um, uh, there is a pragmatism inherent in Vivek in terms of being able to uh, come to an understanding with the Nerevarine if it means the final defeat of Degofor. However, the contrasting opinion is that of Almalexia, the former wife of the Nerevarine, who will not be content to surrender her divinity meekly. Uh, hence the warning from Vivek himself here, defy me and you will know what it is to stand against a god. Now, within the context of everything that has been written here in this uh, extract, which again, I think is perhaps the definitive way of reading this, there is one thing which Vivek stands true to, which is an illusion which could be quite obvious to the player, which is did the arms of e murder um uh, did the arms of e murder uh Nerevar because Nerevar had true had decided to remain true to his oath. And Vivek's contestation is not. And I think of all the questions lingering over Ner um vision uh, Vivek's account here is the question of ultimately what happened to Nerevar. Because even though Vivek will never admit it, there is a certain logic that the arms of e, um, were responsible for, Nere for Nerevar's murder, rather than the other prospect that he was essentially mortally wounded in his contest um, with Degofor. And as uh, James is mentioning in the chat, um, why is Degofor and his intentions to use the tools for himself any any worse than when Sofasil basically announced the same thing and ultimately caused Azura to curse them uh, for creating, for usurping that original power. Um, but there are many aspects, many sort of allusions to, um, to other bits of um, storytelling, which I'll come back to when it comes to the actual story of Morrowind, because this is the, this is the backstory. And with the final paragraph here, which is the coming of the potential Nereverine, uh, we have arrived in the present day of Morrowind. But before getting to that, uh, we have to talk about the political structure of Morrowind. And you can say that this is the most obvious part of the brilliance inherent in Morrowind's world building. Um, rather than create a typical fantasy setting, we've already elucidated the intricacies and the uh, uh, the the contrasting theories, the aspect of a demiurge, the uh, the sort of the god king inherent in the tribunal, all of that aspect. But Morrowind is so much more than that in terms of understanding what is going on in terms of the hierarchy and structure. Of course, schism is a fundamental element to understand the fact that the Dhamma do not submit to a uniform centralized authority lightly and despite the vast powers the tribunal temple they are unable to create a monopoly of power 
The Dunmeri from the original Velofi culture, they began as nomads and then they settled and then they eventually created a civilization based on essentially the resources that they found around them, whether it be the Telvani and Sage of Mora, um, all the greater crab structures of the House Redoran. But what this essentially belays is the fact that the belies essentially is that Morrowind has an incredibly complex and contradictory uh, political structure. Uh, in terms of trying to form some sort of vague um, overarching analogy, I was instantly drawn to the example of Japan, i.e. the tribunal religious structure is representative of the emperor of Japan. Uh, the emperor in Japan is the purported to be the descendant of the sun goddess Amritsu. And so the emperor is in a sense divine uh, within the context of understanding the political structure within Japan, uh, the greater Yamoto dynasty, which made up the people. Um, and of course, that is a very particular conception. It is a theological conception, uh, rooting the legitimacy of the, em of, of the emperor, um, and indeed that of the supposed longevity of the Japanese imperial dynasty. Uh, we can attest it as far as about the seventh century, but the actual sort of mythological foundation of the dynasty goes back further by another thousand years. But of course, that is essentially a religious authority which is bound together by a uh, strict uh, set of etiquette and uh, cadet houses which are surrounding the emperor. The emperor, throughout the context of medieval Japanese history, I'm talking about the uh, periods of the Ashigaga and the uh, the Edo periods and the Zengoku Jidai and even the um, uh, the end of the sort of Hainan period when we come to the era of the Fujiwara regions. I'm throwing out a, a lot of a lot of details here uh, when it comes to the political structure but nevertheless I think the imperial structure in medieval Japan bears very close uh, comparison to what we see with the tribunal temple but moving on from that moving beyond the idea of a established sort of shadow authority, we come to the actual decentralized form of secular power. And these are the King of Morrowind and the Great Houses, the Great Houses, which I've already gone over in some depth. The Great Houses are obviously uh, indicative of a feudalistic nobility. Again, going back to Japan, you can say that uh, the councillors of House Redoran or her House Lalu um, are the daimyo. Uh, the lords, and they owe their power and influence because of the weakness of the central authority. In this case, the shogun would be analogous to a king who throughout most of Japanese history until the Edo period uh, was nothing more than the weak figurehead. And what substantiates this view is that the great houses of Morrowind are not strictly dynastic. Um, they have their own councils. And this could be very much indicative of the cadet branches of the various Japanese houses. So you have a great clan, or in the case of the Togugawa, um, you have a bakufu, a great state or a dynastic administration. And around the bakufu, uh, you have many aligned dynasties. And that, in a sense, would make the equivalent of the great house of Togugawa. And against that, you have the foreign dynasties, the outsiders, the uh, the Tozema. And this, was, for example, will be indicative of the other houses within Morrowind. But within the context of Morrowind, the Bakafu house, i.e. the great house which has the most power and sway within the political structure, albeit that one that has far from uncontested authority, will be House Halalu. And House Halalu is there because of their um, you can say treason, the fact that they've been willing to surrender um, aspects of um, Dunmeri culture in order to prioritize political intrigue and commerce. So they have become wedded uh, to the cause of the empire. And we look at um, uh, Venom Dreth, um, sorry, Dran, if I, if I remember. Yeah. Uh, Vedam Dran, the Duke of Vardenfell, and we look at uh, King Helsis, predecessor. Uh, Halalu typically have been able to monopolize the position of King uh, of Morrowind and Duke of Vardenfell. And of course, if we're looking to more Japanese uh, inspirations, uh, you can look at the 
Japanese daimyo who were prepared to convert to Christianity and form an alliance with the, the Portuguese and the papacy. Um, all of these aspects are obvious um, when drawing comparison with Japan. And I think, I, I mean, to, to me, this is by far the best comparison, but you can draw um, other aspects to this as well. Um, that being that when the Spanish conquistadors came, going back to the Aztec comparison again, uh, the Aztecs weren't essentially wiped out um, in the way that a lot of people seem to think. Um, Tenochtitlan was raised and it was refashioned as Mexico City, but the Spanish authority under the control of the Viceroy of New Spain essentially operated as the formal head of government, but the Mexica people and the natives formed a shadow authority. And this has been referred to as two kingdoms, uh, the kingdoms of uh, the Spaniards and the kingdoms of the Indians. And um, in this way, you can say that the Spanish authority wasn't um, strictly ethnic, but of course, this dualism and this uh, f fundamental contrast of cultures between Mesoamerica um, and Western, Sp uh, Western European Spain uh, obviously brings sort of close comparison between the imperial occupation and the preservation of aspects of uh, Dunmary culture. And of course, there are aspects of synthesis. So for example, a descendant of Montezuma II, uh, yes, the Republic of the Indias, um, the descendant of Montezuma actually became ennobled within the Spanish aristocracy. And you can say this, this again would be indicative of the, uh, the synergizing policies of uh, House Lalu, uh, both to retain control of uh, essentially the Dhamma power structure, but also to do so through allegiance with the empire. And of course, the House Lalu are doing uh, so well um, that they even expand beyond the borders of Morrowind. And in the course of the events of Oblivion, uh, it's Count Indaris is actually the, uh, the Count of Chaden Hall, uh, which is one of the few allusions that Oblivion has to the story and the uh, political structures of Morrowind. But like I said, if people want me to talk about that at the end, I can explain why I believe um, Oblivion gutted many aspects of the incredible world building, which I've tried to outline here. So that is one aspect, which is dynasticism. And dynasticism is key in terms of understanding the peculiarness, uh, peculiarity uh, of the Dunma culture, because I've already mentioned in terms of their architecture, how wedded they are as an organism to the land of Resdane, now Morrowind. But this dynasticism, this veneration of the land is combined with their veneration of their ancestors. And again, a clear Japanese inspiration. The Dhamma practice ancestor worship and the ancestor temples of all of the various um, sort of subsets of the great houses are dotted through the land of Vardenfell. Um, indeed, uh, if you look it, going around anywhere sort of in Vardenfell, I mean, it's almost impossible not to stumble across a um, uh, a, a a tomb uh, de dedicated to one of the houses and invariably uh, one of these tombs will be uh, occupied by a bunch of bandits a vampire or other forms of the undead um, but they are a fundamental facet in terms of the architecture and the landscape um, of Vardenfell and so moving on from this, um, in terms of trying to come up with more sort of aspects of a uh, of a political structure, uh, I've talked about the formation of the great houses, and the the role of essentially cadet branches and the the greater um, the greater sort of um, council system. Um, I have very little to say about Telvani because Telvani is closer to a pure fantasy aspect, getting into the world of magic. But I can very much, in terms of reading history into this, talk about the houses Halalu and Redoran. And then finally, we come to the king. I've already said that um, the king could be indicative of a weak shogun, looking back to the Japanese example of uh, the, uh, the Minamoto shogunate and later the um, Hojo Regency period. Uh, and of course, the Ashigaga shogun who controlled very little outside of the city of Kyoto itself. But when coming to the actual person who occupies the position of king in Morrowind, 
we go from the idea in the abstract, especially in the base game, uh, that the king is essentially a weak shogun, uh, or essentially the first among the dynastic representatives of the great houses. And then we come to an analogy, which I, an analogy which I believe is really obvious, which is that of Helseth is Herod. Um, Herod being the uh, Herod the Great, uh, being the infamous king of Judea, the client king of the Romans um, in the uh, the first century BC, um, dying around the uh, in the same year as the uh, the birth of Christ. And the reason I believe this is such an, um, an apt analogy is, on the one hand, of course, he is a client king to the Romans, so you have that direct link between um, an occupied state and alien culture. For example, he builds the Second Temple, uh, but also subjugation to the Romans. But of course, what is Herod most known for, among other aspects? It's his ruthless pursuit of power at all costs. The painting I've chosen to represent Herod on the right um, is uh, Archimboldo's Herod and the Massacre of Innocents. Um, you can see his face is actually literally made of, um, of uh, essentially the, uh, the children uh, who he ordered to be killed uh, to forestall the rise, essentially, of a competing power, uh, which would be that of the Messiah. Now, anyone uh, who has played Morrowind and has Tribunal installed <laughs> uh, is uh, dealt with the completely bizarre um, uh, situation where you go to sleep and you need to go to sleep in Morrowind in terms of leveling up. So it's going to be a constant feature of your gameplay. You wake up and a member of the Dark Brotherhood tries to kill you. And this can be at level one going to level two. And the Dark Brotherhood assassins are very powerful and they level. So um, in the later in the later levels, if you um, haven't gone over to uh, Mournhold yet and sought out King Helseth, they could be wielding things like uh, Daedric Daikatanas and they can prove very tough opponents. But of course, what is Helsev doing here, even though it completely fails in terms of the mechanics of the gameplay? Um, he is sending off assassins to murder the would-be would messiah, um, which he believes is the Nerevarine. So the Herod inspiration is obvious. I mean, even the name, Helsev Herod. And once you realize that Helsev is essentially an insert for King Herod, you can bring in far more sort of inspirations behind the political structure. Um, the imperial occupation, obviously being reminiscent of the Roman occupation of Judea, um, linking this back to Hindu mythology. You can look at this, or the Hindu religion, in case I offend anyone, um, the British occupation of India, the imperial cult of Rome and Anglican missionaries. Um, and all of this goes to say that we have the incredibly complicated and decentralized power structure within Morrowind. But within that, we have overlapping administrations, legal jurisdictions, and a fundamental clash of cultures. And quite a lot of the um, quests dedicated to the various factions, whether it be House Lalu, the Telvani, uh, Redoran, and even the Imperial Legion, will be dedicated to essentially dealing with um, slander um, or dispersions created by the other houses. So there is mass political friction going on between these various houses, all representing their own sort of source of a, a source of authority. But add tribunal and you now add another power into the mix, which is that of the Herodian uh, King Helseth. But I've already talked extensively about the tribunal power structure, but that really is to say um, that Morrowind is so much more than that. And it's really incredible just bringing in all of these inspirations that again, I can go back to the Aztec example, which I believe is the consistent theme running through the inspiration behind Morrowind, and then bringing in aspects such as Roman occupied Judea and Britain and the Raj in India. So we come from that and we're really talking about the inner mechanics of the houses themselves. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list you see on this slide um, of all of the factions in Morrowind. In fact, this isn't even a list of the joinable factions, but this is simply a segment which I'm going to focus on more because 
when it comes to the Fighters Guild, the Majors Guild, and the Thieves Guild within Morrowind, um, I mean, these are, of course, mainstays throughout all of the Elder Scrolls games. And th there are aspects I like about them. Like I said, with the Majors Guild, there, there is a lot of political intrigue. Um, you, you can find the the, the secret of the, um, the disappearance of the dwarves. Um, and Morrowind has a wonderful structure of branching quest lines. You can go to different quest givers, and they essentially each quest giver uh, has their own private agenda. And there are many ways to actually compete uh, the faction quest line. So in the major skill, for example, there is an option to kill the current Morrowind, uh, um, Morrowind uh, designated Archmage, or you can actually uh, peacefully uh, remove him uh, if you so wish, if you take one of the direct paths. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that the Fighters Guild, the Majors Guild, and the Thieves Guild are obviously there to appeal to the three styles of role playing the mage, the warrior, and the thief. Um, and what I can really bring to this discussion is say that these organizations are indicative of the overweening administration of the empire into Morrowind. Uh, what the major skill essentially represents for Morrowind is a bunch of essentially busybodies, um, invade, and some of them involved in primary research, others essentially involved in um, bureaucra bureaucracy and egoism. And then you have someone at the top, uh, the archmage, um, uh, Trebonius, uh, who is completely useless and only seems to be there because of nepotism. Uh, there's a lot of cute intrigue in Morrowind, and there's a lot of um, moral greyness in the characters. Uh, and of course, in the subsequent games, all of this tends to be gutted out, and uh, this sort of uh, moral ambiguity and intrigue seems to be left with very, very few characters. Um, of course, the Fighters Guild and the Thieves Guild are involved in a war, as the Majors Guild is involved in low-intensity conflict versus House Telvani. So this would, again, represent the idea of a decentralized political structure uh, inherent throughout Vardenfell. Um, but in terms of going into some depth, when it comes to organizations like the Thieves Guild, the Thieves Guild are essentially a, um, a corrupt extension of the imperial government in some ways. They're essentially a, a, a shadow authority. Um, they represent, essentially, some of them are, you can say, representative of the empire, but on the whole, it's a shadowy criminal syndicate. Uh, but nevertheless, it has certain agendas. So uh, Stacy, the head of the Thieves School of Morrowind, is actually invested in terms of being able to ingratiate the imperial institution uh, into the culture of Ardenfell. And so he recreates the idea of the um, Baumalagma, uh, which is effectively Morrowind's answer to the, uh, the tale of Robin Hood. Um, but beyond that, the main factions with historical illusions uh, are House Redoran and uh, House Lalu. And I'll get to the Imperial Cult and the Kamon Tong and um, I, s some more obscure factions as well, such as um, uh, the Buoyant Armagers. But starting off with House Redoran, which is one of the three uh, great uh, houses. And um, as Morrowind is a role-playing game, they commit um, they commit to a playstyle here, which isn't again follow through with the other games, uh, which is the um, exclusive faction pathways. So the great houses are, you can say, the most fleshed out in terms of the um, playable content within Morrowind, um, but you can only join one per game. And indeed, it's funnier to assume that you go through a process of building a stronghold dedicated to your faction, and then you are sent off to actually go and kill your would-be member. So, for example, if you join House Telvani, you have to kill your alt iteration for the Redoran House and Halalu and, uh, and vice versa. Um, so it, it's as if when you join a house, uh, an alter ego is created, which goes through a parallel process of advancement, and you need to eliminate them. <laughs> but anyway, going back to House Redoran, and again, taking my sources from the actual in-game books, and this is the True Nobles Code. The honorable warriors of the great House Redoran are the hereditary defenders of, the, of Morrowind. To be a noble of House Redoran is more than being a great warrior. One must follow the triune virtues of duty, gravity, and piety. A Redoran's duty is first to the Tribunal Temple, second to the Great House Redoran, and third to one's family and clan. A Redoran must show piety to Adra and Daedra, our creatures and ancestors, for without the divine, we, are, we don't have the chance to serve. 
and without divine law we would not know right from wrong, and without giving thanks for these things we would forget our place and purpose. So again, devotion to the tribunal temple, like a Japanese uh, daimyo's ostensible or samurai's ostensible devotion uh, to the emperor. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I think in terms of a code of honor uh, underpinning the House Redoran. Um, obviously, Redoran are probably the closest thing that the uh, Dhamma have to a samurai class. And this honor code would be consistent with the ideas of um, Bushido, uh, particular emphasis on duty, uh, gravity, and piety, and indeed the, the veneration of loyalty to the clan and loyalty to ancestor worship. Um, you can say that this is clearly the most sort of a uh, Japanese in terms of the inspirations here. Now contrast this uh, with House Lalu, grasping fortune. House Lalu is the most open and modern of the great houses. We are the only great house who has embraced the irresistible tides of imperial law and custom, and thus we have profited by the empire's new policies, rising from obscurity as the greatest of the houses. In the great wind of progress, tradition cannot stand. So Morally, they represent the complete antithesis to Redoran, and you can rep you can say that this represents the um, the eternal story throughout history of the um, of the true in terms of nationalism, which is House Redoran, who also seem to be the most uh, hostile to uh, outsiders, uh, especially their leader uh, will not countenance um, a threat to his power whatsoever and will insist when you challenge him to fight you off in a uh, fight to the death, uh, bold and venom. Um, but House Lalu are self-identified to be opportunists and they are self-identified to be collaborators. Um, so, so it's really clear uh, and the fact the fact that's so wonderful about the world building here is that they just openly admit it. <laughs> they admit how they've come to power and they admit their objectives. And so long as they can continue to rise within the superstructure of the empire, uh, the culture of Morrowind, its traditions and the other houses are fair game to them. Um, and like I said, I mean, there are so many instances of um, uh, treachery and uh, collaboration that uh, I, I don't really need to go into them. They seem to be so obvious. Um, but like I said, within the power structure of the factions of Morrowind, there is the nativist nationalist house, which is House Redoran, attached to a code of honor. And then there is the deceitful and treacherous House Lalu. And of course, the wonderful thing about Morrowind is that you can choose to join either, including House Telvani. Um, like I said, there's very little I can say about House Telvani within the structure of the stream, which is a shame because House Telvani is my favorite house. Um, I think it's by far the best uh, faction, um, magic faction within the Elder Scrolls series. But that's also indicative of the fact that Morrowind has the best magic system. And what Oblivion and, and Skyrim did was essentially nerf the magic users. Um, which is incredibly depressing. And every time I bring I play Morrowind, it makes the subsequent games uh, almost unplayable, given the fact that you have levitation, uh, transportation, um, spell crafting, uh, all of the old uh, spell schools, mysticism, all of these things that were uh, cut um, in the later games. It's interesting to see that the subsequent games have uh, mechanical streamlining and limitations, but uh, there we are. But of course, uh, just in terms of giving over some of the um, facets of Telvani and going into this, uh, uh, you can say incredibly sort of uh, amoral and um, blasé culture they have in terms of the, their, their frank sort of um, disregard for human life. They are fundamentally an elitist house. Um, they are structured essentially around might makes right. Uh, their leadership are the most powerful of the wizards, and they are completely A-OK -okay with the idea of slavery um, to do essentially the busy work that they themselves um, don't want to participate in. Uh, the wizards are surrounded in game by a coterie of lesser wizards um, and various mercenaries who keep order within the Telvani provinces. And of course, to make matters worse, not only are the Telvani incredibly powerful, but they're also uh, mentally unhinged. So one of the early quests uh, in House Telvani will have you uh, deliver uh, some clothes to uh, Great Councillor Thorana. And you're, you're given an odd um, suggestion 
which is the minute you give her the clothes, teleport immediately out because uh, she may take it the wrong way. <laughs> and uh, curiously enough, you give her the clothes. Um, she insists you put them on, believing they might be poisoned, I believe, going off um, going off memory. And then uh, Therana um, accuses you of stealing them and she tries to kill you. And you have to find a way of getting out there, especially if you're on a low level, she can kill you very easily. So essentially, the Telvani know she's mad. They're not going to do anything about it. And uh, they're completely sort of blasé about the fact that you may be killed in the process. Um, but if anything, that's completely indicative of the Telvani mindset. They just do not care. Um, in the same way that their mushroom structures, which I've alluded to earlier, are simply designed to prevent non-magic users from being able to access and talk to the Telvani wizards, uh, hence why levitation uh, is an essential school in terms of actually being able to interact with the Telvani. That's not to assume uh, they're all uh, elitist isolationists uh, who are fundamentally misanthropic and bent on power. Um, the sponsor for the player uh, is one uh, Master Arion, uh, who is featured in the top here, um, who has, like House Halalu, you can say, he is Telvani's uh, answer to uh, House Halalu. Uh, he has accepted the Imperial, Imperial administration. His uh, great tower is actually immersed within an Imperial uh, fort, and he is interested in actually governing House Telvani, um, as if it were one of the other houses, in terms of bringing together council members, having a ruling political body, and promoting the rise of the player, who also will happen to be the Hortator, um, in order to effect a favorable outcome for Telvani in the greater political contest, um, which is also involved in terms of making political deals with the other houses. Um, so that's not to simply say that Telvani is monolithic in terms of its structure. Uh, there is a great deal of nuance here. But as I said, um, there is a it is fundamentally a magic faction, so I can't really bring too many historical comparisons to that. Like I said, the Mages Guild, despite being a historical faction, it essentially fo um, functions like a traditional medieval university, I being a source of um, uh, aggregation of knowledge and primary research within the context of being promoted and uh, financed uh, by the imperial government. The flip side of the Thieves Guild is actually the Kamonatong, um, which again provides remarkable nuance to Halalu, despite the um, self-professed mission statement in Grasping Fortune that House Halalu is basically interest in elevation and collaboration. Um, the Kamonatong, represented by the head of House Halalu's own brother, uh, Orvastran, uh, is a member of a organization which is dedicated to ridding uh, Vardenfell of outlanders and not for any sort of higher purpose, but simply for the simply so they can subjugate, economically manipulate and essentially act as a, um, a, a overarching criminal syndicate uh, using outlanders and nothing more than essential slaves. Um, so yes, there is a um, oikophobic aspect to Halalu and then there is a extremely prejudiced aspect of House Lalu. Um, and part of the story of House Lalu is being able to um, uh, moderate these various forces and to add a bit more intrigue into the story of House Lalu. Uh, or the Stran, uh, if you don't join uh, Halalu and bring him down, actually goes off to join the sixth house. And this would be completely consistent with his character because the sixth house is dedicated to ridding Vardenfell of all outlanders. Um, and again, to add further complexity to this and nuance, um, Vedam Drans, I believe it's his daughter, is the head of a secret organization called the Twin Lamps, uh, which is an abolitionist organization there to uh, free uh, Khajiit, but primarily Argonian, the lizard people. Uh, from slavery. And of course, who is the biggest slave owner uh, in Vardenfell? It's her uncle, uh, Orva Strand. So all of these facets existing not only within one faction, uh, but within one family. And of course, the great irony is that once you become the head of House Lalu, uh, you also become the um, 
head of House Lalu, you also become the head of the Kamonatong, which will seem to be completely incompatible organizations, but there you are. Uh, the eccentric tripper is mentioning, did you kiss Crassius Curio? Crassius Curio is the imperial who is responsible for sponsoring your rise in House Lalu. And weirdly enough, he can actually prove to be quite a valuable ally for the player, but he insists on uh, seeing you naked uh, in order to allow you to progress. Um, and of course, why is he so invested in this? Well, he's the author of the uh, the Lusty Argonian Maid, which is the most uh, uh, memed, um, lewd tale within the context of Morrowind. Uh, but again, like I said, there's there's the wonderful sort of aspects of comedy um, inserted into Morrowind, despite the fact that uh, all of this is scripted and there are, there's very little voice acting despite her uh, greetings and uh, Degofor and uh, Almalexia's speech there. Um, so Halalu is probably a great faction, especially for beginners to join. Um, I mean, Redoran is actually very depressing to play because uh, you don't make any money from doing it because they are the quote unquote honor house. So those are the most of the factions, but finally getting to the Imperial factions. There's very little I can actually say about the Legion. Um, I think the Legion is necessary as a faction, and it's something that bizarrely does not exist in Oblivion. The Legion is everywhere, but you can't join it. I mean, the Legion would have a perfect um, place within the context of um, Oblivion because it could form a divergent path between you being a good person, quote unquote, or a bad person, uh, saying that very simplistically. But essentially, if you become a legionary, you can align with Adamus Philippa and Hieronymus Lex to stamp out the uh, the rogue guilds, the thieves guild and uh, the Dark Brotherhood. Um, but of course, for some bizarre reason that I'll never be able to understand, the Legion does not exist as a joinable faction in Oblivion. And instead, what we have as the Legion in Morrowind uh, is there to solve a couple of murders and essentially act as a uh, <laughs> a uh, a garrison force. And much of the intrigue associated with what the Empire is doing uh, in Morrowind is actually left to the Blades, uh, which I'll, I'll lead towards the end. But simply to say that the Blades um, acts as the Emperor's uh, essentially secret intelligence uh, within the state of Morrowind. And they have a very nuanced perspective when it comes to um, the passage of the Nerevarine. But uh, su suffice to say that when it comes to the Empire itself in Morrowind, having any sort of proactive policy or agency it isn't really apparent in the Legion faction, which is, like I said, a garrison faction within Morrowind, but it is apparent in terms of the Blades. Um, you would have thought, really, that the Legion would actually have some vested interest in taking the fight directly to the Sixth House, um, but that is a task essentially left to the Nerevarim. And now we come to the Imperial Cult. I bring up the Imperial Cult because it acts as a nice contrast to the Temple, and I'm just going to read a segment from For My Gods and Emperor, which is the official handbook you're given when you join. We acknowledge the divinity of the Nine Divines, Akatosh, Debella, Arche, Xenophar, Mara, Stendar, Kinnereth, Julianos, and Tiber Septim, Talos. We preach the nine virtues associated with them, humility, inspiration, piety, work, compassion, justice, ambition, learning, and civility. Our emperor is the defender of the faith and the empire is the worldly working of the divine plan. We pledge aid and comfort to all citizens in need and serve the empire and the empire at his will. Well, I mean, as a faction, I mean, that is the most obviously historically derivative. As I said, the imperials are so obviously Romans and the imperial cult are obviously a fusion of Roman polytheism and Christianity. Roman polytheism in the sense that the head of the Julian Claudius, uh, the Julian Claudian dynasty, uh, Julius Caesar, um, was deified. He became the divine Julius, who himself was ostensibly descended from uh, Venus Genetrix, and he formed himself at the head of a Roman pantheon around the various polytheistic entities, such as in this case, it would be um, for Morrowind, uh, Akatosh, uh, Debella, uh, Stendar, etc. Um, so they are a polytheistic religion, obviously inspired by the example of the titular imperial cult, which existed in Rome, uh, but they are clearly warped to conform to a Christian, dare I say, Catholic 
um, interpretation of the world, um, but also as an extension of the emperor as the defender of the faith. You can say this is a rather Anglican conception. Um, there, are, there is no sort of equivalent pope contesting imperial authority. Um, rather, the emperor is the head of the religion as the defender of the faith, and they are subject to a divine plan, but what that is isn't really ever elucidated. And as I said, these are the Aedra, uh, these aren't the Daedra, so these are the same gods um, which have essentially been the original pantheon of the Aldmeri, the faction which the Chima broke from to create the cult of the three good Daedra. So the irony again is here, as with the Numidium coming back to impose a force of, uh, to basically subjugate um, the Dunma, having already essentially defeated that force back at the Battle of Red Mountain, the Chima, having explicitly rejected the faith of the Adria, are now having the Adria thrust upon them, except in this case it is led by the imperial force of occupation. So continuing on, and this segment's actually quite interesting because it represents how the imperial mission has situated and understands itself within the context of the Morrowind political situation. The imperial cults have a very close relationship with the imperial legions, obviously, and a friendly and supportive relationship with the imperial guards. And obviously this conforms the idea that they are essentially a, uh, a missionary force accompanying a foreign occupation. And they are friendly with the fighters and majors guild, again, an extension of the empire. We also have a friendly and supportive relationship with House Halalu, go figure, and strongly supports the emperor and imperial principles. Though we cannot condone the actions of the Thieves' Guild, we praise their faithful dedication to the emperor and to imperial culture. So again, you can say that the imperial cult is prepared to put politics and the greater principles of the empire and the subversive sort of qualities which endear the Thieves' Guild to the empire um, ahead of their religious mission. The imperial cults have the greatest respect for the high moral principles of House Redoran and the Morag Tong, and honours their different but noble conceptions of divine inspiration. So unlike Christianity and monotheism in general, the imperial cult is syncretist. It is prepared to work with other belief systems in Morrowind for the sake of basically cultivating good relations and essentially gaining converts. So it has done most successfully with House Halalu, but it's trying to make inroads with House Redoran and the Morag Tong, um, essentially because they aren't outright hostile um, to the worship of the Adria. But like I said, there is a fundamental pragmatism where the imperial cult seems to be prioritizing the imperial mission um, ahead of any sort of a universalism. And if but universalism, I mean, in terms, in terms of imposing one faith, it is syncretic. It tends to bring gods and other relief systems into a form of universal religion under the emperor fealty to the imperial cause, whereas Morrowind and the tribunal temple is xenophobic. It is rooted in the Dunmeri civilization and Dunmeri exceptionalism uh, in and of itself. Uh, Sunakas is saying the religion is definitely more like pagan Rome. Like I said, it's, the imperial cult is pagan Rome in terms of its political organization, um, but in terms of its outlook, it's essentially Christian, even in terms of the uh, the nomenclature. But like I said, the actual godhead and the polytheism is Roman, uh, but the principles are Christian. Uh, so continuing on, historically, our relationship with the tribunal temple, uh, sorry, continue, sorry, before them, we disapprove of the primitive heathen beliefs of the Ashlanders and of the impious and inhumane practices of the Telvani. The imperial cult especially disapproves of the practice of slavery and looks forward to the day when slavery is legal in all imperial provinces. The imperial cult also disapproves of the lawless and greedy Kamonotong and their ruthless exploitation of the poor and weak. It should also be mentioned, as I've said, that the Kamonotong are Dunmeri nativists, so would be the most uh, viscerally opposed to um, the imperial mission. That and the Telvani don't care. And uh, uh, if, if uh, Semiagog will hear rather jokingly, uh, you can say that the imperial cult um, is attempting to use the slavery issue um, to essentially find an angle to undermine uh, the Telvani. Um, but 
that's neither here nor there, but that's uh, clearly an, an angle and a very sort of uh, astute and subtle angle, which I think could be used to uh, uh, to dig um, at the pre-existing social structures of, um, of Morrowind. And of course, the association with the heathen beliefs of the Ashlanders. The Ashlanders are vilified and essentially ostracized within broader Dunmary civilization. So again, it's rather politic for them to uh, disassociate with the Ashlanders. And I'll explain why in a bit. And finally, historically, our relationship with the tribunal temple is difficult and unfriendly. Though the imperial cult acknowledges the lords and saints of the temple, pantheon is worthy inspirations, the temple falsely insists that theirs is the one true faith, and then the imperial cults worship false gods. So fundamentally, this is the stumbling block when it comes to imperial penetration and colonization um, into the um, uh, the sort of uh, depths of Dunmary culture. The tribunal political structure and um, the faith of the nine are fundamentally opposed. And going back to what Vivek said in his uh, delivery to the dissident priest, it's entirely rational for Vivek to believe that the Nereverine is actually a imperial cat's paw. And the reason I say that is because the Nereverine will be responsible essentially for undermining and destroying the legitimacy of the continued worship of the temple i.e. ironically the Nereverine could be used to extend imperial religious control throughout the province and then we come to the temple i had mentioned earlier this idea of nietzscheanism of will to power uh, being inherent in the legitimation of the arms of the tribunal's right to rule and it's made obvious when you look at the temple faction and you look at the fundamental article of faith which will be the closest thing that the tribunal temple has to a religious creed Almalexia, Vivek and Sofasil, and mortal guardians of Morrowind who walked the earth, defeated the Dumbers' greatest enemies, the Nords and the Dwarves, and achieved divine substance through superhuman discipline and virtue and supernatural wisdom and insight like loving ancestors, they guard and counsel their followers. Like stern parents, they punish sin and error. Like generous relatives, they share their bounty among the greatest and the least according to their needs. So on the one hand, that's obviously an allusion to the Nietzsche, Nietzschean supermensch, the arrival of the new man, um, that their right to power is an extension of their will to power. And going back to the idea of Dunmary particularism, and this as being a manifestation of Dunmer nationalism. Thank you for your pride, Lord Vivek. I shall not doubt myself or my people or my gods and shall insist upon them and my ancient rights. The ancient rights and continuity of the nation of Vardenfell are essential in terms of understanding the tribunal's worship. And so long as the tribunal essentially acts as a vehicle for the preservation of Dunmary culture, it can act as that fundamental break against the cultural soft power uh, inroads of the empire into the Dunma. And so you can say in many ways, um, the tribunal temple are actively undermined by the presence of the empire, yet they become a necessity to those who want to uphold uh, Dunma culture uh, in the face of, um, uh, of a foreign threat. And here we get to the buoyant armagers, and I'm just going to go back to Vivek's uh, 36 sermons for a bit. From the provincial house, he looked into the middle world to find the third monster called the Horde Mountain. It was made of modular warriors running free, but spaced according to patterns, and from the highest warriors who could cut clouds, they spread out beneath him. Like a tree, a skirt whose bottom circle was an army that ran through the ash. Vivek admired the cone shaped of his child and remembered with joy the whirlwind of fighting styles that instructed him during the days before life. Vivek moved into Velof, saying, Onus, but before he could get to them within the sword span of the monster, a trio of lower houses trapped the horde monster in a net of doubtful doctrine. When they saw their lord, the Velofi cheered, We are happy to serve you and win, they said. Vivek smiled at those brave souls around him and summoned celebrations, uh, celebration demons to cleave unto the victors. There was a great display of love and duty around the netted monster, and Vivek was at the centre with a headdress made of mating bones. He laughed and told mystical jokes about the, the, and made their heads of the three houses marry and become a new order. You shall forever be now my buoyant armagers, he said. The buoyant armagers are essentially a begin also, uh, mythically as a group of um, monster slayers. Uh, they begin as you can say uh, heroes of antiquity, um, mythological heroes. 
But the organization that they had become uh, by the events of the game Morrowind are effectively the Knights Templar. The Buoyant Armagers, along with the Ordinators, are there to protect the pilgrimage routes for the members of the temple. And they are also there at the Ghost Gate. The Ghost Gate is the major fortress which separates the rest of the Ashlands uh, from the region of Red Mountain, uh, which is infested with uh, corpus beasts, um, various minions of Dagoth Ur, and of course the dreaded Blight. Um, so they are essentially the religious body dedicated and formulated by Vivek uh, to prevent the power of Dago for essentially overcoming them. And as a result of that, they form a elite organization, uh, even compared to the ordinators of House Inderul, um, who are some of the most uh, powerful um, enemies you can find in Morrowind, uh, who also have um, some of the most, uh, the best uh, medium armor in the game, or some of the best medium armor anyway. So on the one hand, the buoyant armagers represent a crusading zeal to, pre to preserve the pilgrimage routes and defend the tribunal temple. And contrasting that, we finally get to, I believe, a fan favorite, which is the Morag Tong. And this is from uh, Sermon 22 of the 36 Lessons. Vivek withdrew into the hiding place and found the darkest mothers of the Morag Tong, taking them all to wife and filling them with undusted loyalty that tasted of summer salt. They became as black queens, screaming lie with a hundred murderous sons, a, th th a thousand murderous arms, and a hundred thousand murderous hands, one vast moving event of thrusting, kill laughter in alleys, palaces, workshops, cities, and secret halls. Their movements among the holdings of Radham were as rippled endings, heaving between times with all the fates leading to the swallowed knives, murderers moaning, God's holy rape erasure of wet death. So why would Vivek associate with that organization and basically give it original backing? Well, it had already existed in accordance with the values of Mafala. Mafala, the web spinner. Mafala, the essentially the Daedric god of uh, sex and uh, sec um, secret plots of murder. And Vivek himself is supposed to be the anticipation. Um, sorry, Mafala is supposed to be the anticipation of Vivek. So Vivek has a special relationship with Mafala, and the Morag Tong are essentially are the closest thing Mafala has to a religious body. So how do we get to a religious body which has state approval, um, which also carries out the acts of uh, secret murder, um, essentially with, with uh, standard writs? The player can go around and basically get a free murder pass by handing out a writ to a guard if they're caught um, murdering their target. So obviously this is obscene, right? How can there be a religious organization going out there murdering with impunity with uh, official state approval? Uh, well, there is a historical comparison to this, which is the Order of Assassins or the Hashashin, uh, which is actually where we get the word assassin. The Fadiyin or the, uh, the greater self-sacrificing warriors uh, of the Nizar Ismaili domain, um, which came into existence at the end of the 11th century. Um, around the time of the First Crusade. And they formed a religious um, organization within the broader context of Islam, um, one that still hasn't inherited today. Um, so they were a, first of all, they were essentially a religious cult, uh, but they were also a martial cult. They occupied various fortresses in Iran. And in accordance with the interests of the cult, uh, they would go around and they would assassinate uh, very important figures. Uh, they assassinated caliphs of Islam and they attempted to assassinate um, Richard the Lionheart. So the Morag Tong is very clearly influenced by the domain of the Nizar Ismailis, a religious organization uh, predicated around the idea of murder, but murder as a religious profession, a manifestation of the preservation of their particular brand of Islam. Um, but of course, that could be subverted and carry out the political aims of whatever organization they were attached to. So the irony is here that Vivek is responsible for consolidating the Templars as part of the extension of the Morrowind political power structure Yet, he is also responsible for empowering the Order of Assassins. The Order of the Assassins 
and the Templars are part of the same superstructure uh, with similar origins. The buoyant armagers are used to go out and fight external enemies, whereas the Morag Tong are essentially a secret religious cult who operate within the shadows there to seek out the internal enemies of um, essentially, first of all, of Mafala, obviously, who isn't always aligned uh, with Vivek, but nevertheless it can and often does carry out Vivek's nominal agendas. Again, the historical irony when you read into these factions and the history becomes so readily apparent that within the world of Morrowind, Vivek is responsible for the Templars and he's also responsible for the Order of Assassins. So coming to the last group, um, which I, I didn't reference obvious reasons which will become apparent uh, when talking about the broader political structure and the factions, which is that of the Ashlanders. The Ashlanders are parochial rural dwellers. They have nomadic origins, obviously. I mean, it's already been referenced by Vivek himself that the Dhamma began as no, began as nomads and they settled in essentially a, um, a Mongolian type existence. But of course, going back to my original thread regarding the Aztecs, the Aztecs, were relative latecomers in terms of Mesoamerican civilization. The Aztecs coming from Atzlan were um, originally nomads, which is why they had a, you can say, a more ferocious and pure iteration of the worship of Quetzalcoatl um, because they weren't sullied by urban traditions. And of course, this buys into Toynbee's association that they represented a more primitive, barbarous iter um, version of um, the Mesoamerican pantheon. And of course, this leads into what I've already mentioned, Mongol origins and the idea of Tengriism, of monotheism. And within the context of the Yuan dynasty, um, the Mongol empire, there is a cultural shift that was, um, I, I believe it was best exemplified by the Turlewood civil wars. You have um, Arik Boka and Kublai Khan. Arik Boka believes essentially that the Mongols should return to their nomadic roots of conquest. And Kublai Khan believes that the Mongols should assimilate into Chinese culture and establish a new Chinese dynasty, which becomes the Yuan dynasty. Kublai Khan wins, and essentially the Mongols, um, culturally, they're defeated until they are driven out of China proper. So in terms of this direct contrast between a scenicized, I Chinese Mongol civilization and returning to roots, uh, the Ashlanders can represent that fundamental conflict in value of that values between a urbanized Dunmeri culture, worse, an imperialized Dunmeri culture, um, versus the more primitive and you can say authentic culture, which is represented by the Ashlanders. And I do mean authentic literally in the context of this game, because in addition to being spurned by cosmopolitan society, they represent the true faith. They are essentially part and extension of the cult of the Nerevarine. The Nerevarine traditions are fundamental to the distinctiveness of the Ashlanders. Um, they are therefore vilified by the tribunal temple and for obvious reason. And on the one hand, you can say, yes, they're barbarous, but on the other, they represent a, not just a cultural, uh, but an ideological threat to the dominion of the tribunal temple. And how have they been allowed to exist for you know, literally thousands of years? Um, it's because they are nomadics, so they can move around, but they essentially live in close proximity to Red Mountain, uh, the most inhospitable region in all of Morrowind. Um, so there is very little in terms of a direct sort of military or even economic incentive to go around and subjugate the Ashlanders. The closest thing the Ashlanders have in terms of proximity to civilization is probably the existence of various Ashlander uh, tribes. Um, in the Grayslands, and someone in the chat is saying uh, they are the chill, chill, they are the true children of Velof. In a sense, yes, uh, you are correct. They are the you can say the uh, the purest exemplification of Velothi civilization. And in terms of finding a historical comparison to this other than looking at the nomadism, I actually am reminded of Iran and Zoroastrianism. And the reason I mention this is because obviously there is a formal opponent to the tribunal temple, which is the four corners, the house of troubles. But the Nerevering cult is something altogether different. And to my mind, 
as the older iteration of the faith, this can be used as an analogy to draw uh, between the Ashlanders and the conquest of urban civilization and indeed foreign civilization. And one can look at this as the rise of Islam, the rise of Islam assimilating Iranian Sassanid culture into a new, essentially um, Arabized culture. Nevertheless, for hundreds of years, there are Iranians, in particular in the Mazandran uh, and in the Zagros Mountains, who hold true to the for the previous uh, Persian Iranian belief, uh, which was the state religion of the Sasanian Empire. And of course, associated with this idea of the Ashlanders representing some form of subjugated, lingering element of uh, Zoroastrianism, uh, you can look at the inherent dualism in Zoroastrianism and Again, the idea of um, monotheism, indeed, their devotion to Azura. In this Zoroastrian conception, we have Ahura Mazda versus Araman. Um, Ahura Mazda representing good and Araman representing evil. Um, Ahura Mazda here would be Nerevar as an aspect of Azura. Um, even Ahura Mazda is very close in terms of the wording to Azura. And of course, Araman here, in terms of the Ashlander conception, would be Degov Ur. What would the tribunal represent? They would basically represent fallen angels to the Ashlanders, uh, the Amasha Spenta. And what is interesting about the Amasha Spenta and the Zoroastrian tradition is they are seen as immortals, but they are specifically creative immortals. And who could be more creative than the, uh, the poet warrior archetype, uh, who is, of course, Vishnu? And I bring up these um, uh, Vivek Vishnu, and I bring up the Sasanian comparison in particular because the moon and star is the pseudonym for Nerevar, Nerevar moon and star, when you are greeted by Dig of Ur. The moon and star is wrongly conflated with uh, historic Islam, but really it's the inheritance of the Corinthian tradition bestowed on Byzantium and later conquest by Mehmed II. The moon and star, in terms of a in terms of a symbol, obviously there's the Corinthian example of that, uh, but there's also a Sasanian element. If you look at Sasanian Iranian coinage in around the fourth century, uh, they have the moon and star on them. They have become an element of the Sasanian royal house. And of course, the moon and star also represents the morning star, represents Venus, represents Azura. So it only reinforces the idea that Nerevar has some sort of deeper Sasanian connection, which would reinforce my point about the Ashlanders and Zoroastrianism. Nerevar is moon and star. He is the promise of the prophecy of Azura come to ultimate fruition. Um, and someone is saying there is a perception in Morrowind that it's tripartite. Yes, the triad, the trinity, the triad within uh, Crowley's uh, Telema. Yes, the triad is a repeated motif throughout many world religions. But there is also a triad conception within Zoroastrianism itself, uh, which is associated with the order of angels. So yes, Ahura Mazda is the greatest within this triune conception, but actually such a tradition does exist within Zoroastrianism. Uh, it is entirely consistent with Morrowind's depiction of the good Daedra. But within the Nereverine cult traditions of the Ashlanders, uh, Azura would effectively be the principal, uh, the, pr the principal power. She would be Ahura Mazda. So what does Nerevar represent going from the Ashlander connection to Nerevar as made manifest within the story as a heroic archetype? Well, Nerevar, obviously there's an allusion to Christ. There's an allusion to Elijah. There's an allusion to King Arthur. Um, I would say in Lord of the Rings, there's also an allusion to Erendil. Christ, of course, was there to essentially, an aspect of Christ was there to expose the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and he was ultimately damned by the Sanhedrin. Elijah was there to challenge the authority of the priesthood of Baal. Arthur was there to defend the kingdom of Britons and to find the Holy Grail. Erendil essentially heralded the final defeat of Morgoth in the fortress of Angband and the destruction of the Silmarils, which 
could possibly be some very sort of minor link towards Kagranak's tools. And coming to Nerevar as a persecuted figure, because the Nerevarian cult is persecuted as by extension the Ashlanders are, I'm again reminded of Dostoevsky as I was in a previous stream, which is the Grand Inquisitor, which is the religious superstructure, which in this case would be the tribunal temple, is formulated around Nerevar's sacrifice in the Battle of Red Mountain, yet it has superseded the need to worship Nerevar, and so the Grand Inquisitor needs to burn Christ, or in this case, the Arch Canon or Vivek needs to destroy Nerevar um, in order to perpetuate the religious power structure, which is the tribunal temple. Um, I mean, to, to me, that example is incredibly obvious. And um, in terms of just building upon this example of persecution and a retreat into the extremities, it was already been brought up the idea of um, Holomain Monastery, a sacred site in terms of the worship of Azura. Well, one of the quests in Morrowind has you rescuing a, me a member of the Nerevarian cult, a dissident from the temple, Mera Milo. She leads you to the Holomain Monastery, where there's a huge archive of material relating to the prospect that you are the Nerevarian and learning about the Nerevarian cult. The Holomain Monastery is essentially a ancient and fortified archive. And as a monastery, you can say it bears very close resemblance to other elements in the Middle East, which I've covered recently on my stream about uh, Christians in the Middle East, which is that political centers and cultural centers uh, huddled away in these mountains were invariably um, monasteries. And Holmey Monastery, you can say, would be the epitome of that system as it exists within Morrowind. Yes, you have the primitive Ashlanders representing some form of a true Velofi civilization, but the actual cultural wealth of the um, civilization itself uh, is contained within the fortified monastery at Holmayan. So moving on from here, we have rather sort of uh, classic um, analogies one can draw that this is the prophesized one, this is the Messiah. I mean, that that's completely obvious. Within an Islamic tradition, you can say that this is the coming of the Mahdi. But this parallels very nicely with Dagoth Ur. And I'm reminded of Pontius Pilate and the uh, prosecution of Jesus, because there were two iterations of a Messiah presented to the Jewish people. One was Jesus, the long suffering essentially in this situation. And the other, and of course, representing that kind temperament, peace, and of course, that is very indicative of the Nerevarine's own personality. But then we have Barabbas, the zealot. Barabbas, of course, also meaning the son of God. Dagoth Ur essentially could be one iteration of that Messiah, Barabbas, the zealot who is going to drive out the Romans. And Jesus essentially could be the Messiah which is despised by the temple which is the Sanhedrin. But that's not simply enough, because like I said, all of these aspects are contained within the world of Morrowind, but it's not entirely, it's not derivative. All of these aspects are taken and then they're jumbled up. So Dagoth Ur is also emblematic of the idea of the king under the mountain. The king who was put away or possibly slain, like Barbarossa, or the marble emperor Constantine, who will one day rise from the mountain and reclaim his kingdom again, whether that be the restoration of Constantinople or whatever. In this sense, Degofo arising out of the mountain, deposing the false gods who would be the tribunal, and crushing the outlanders, and leading a crusade against the empire to restore the power and respect of Morrowind. But of course, with Nerevar, it's not simply an aspect associated with prophecy coming to the realization of the true Messiah, which is Nerevar. But going back to the Alistair Crowley and the esoteric tradition inherit, I believe, in Kirk Bright's thought, Nerevar could be Osiris, Osiris who was murdered by Set and then is reincarnated as Horus. Uh, the great warrior king god um, within the context of the Egyptian pantheon, because rather incorrectly, the incarnate 
the man-made flesh is the theme attributed, but of course he's not the incarnate, he is the reincarnate. And the reincarnate here essentially could be Horus. So yes, it's not simply a direct analogy to Christ. In terms of this idea of the slaying of Nerevar and the Battle of Red Mountain, and what that ultimately means, I come back to what I mentioned at the, uh, at the beginning of the stream, which is the Wagnerian analogy. The idea that Siegfried was the hero. Siegfried represented the antithesis to the corrupt control of the Valhalla gods, but Siegfried was ultimately, and Siegfried of course renounced the power of the ring, but Siegfried was murdered by Hagen, and Hagen in the situation would be analogous to Degofur. And here, when talking about the pure fantasy elements, the Tolkien influences really come through. Red Mountain is clearly Mount Doom or Angband, but like I said, there is an aspect going back to right at the beginning of the stream when I looked at this painting and was inspired by the view from Sage of Mor Mora, uh, which is the idea, like with Mount Fuji, of the sacred mountain. The sacred mountain is representing some sort of summit for divinity, uh, Olympus probably being the most present example of that. Um, so Red Mountain is both a sacred mountain, but it has also become the source of great evil. So it is both Olympus and it is now Angband, to go back to the Silmarillion. There are other inspirations as well, going back to Angband in particular, which isn't something Tolkien really fleshes out in the Silmarillion, but Tolkien mentions vampires. Who were the chief lieutenants of Dagoth Ur? They are, of course, the House Dagoth vampires the ones which slaying effectively will weaken Degofer, albeit mechanically this isn't really borne out because Degofer isn't that strong to begin with so you don't really need to kill them. But from a law perspective they seem to be indicative of Tolkien's, vampire, of Tolkien's vampires, the Ash vampires. And then of course Degofer's evil plan is to use corpus, the corpus disease, as a form of mind control and through corpus he creates wraiths, essentially a form of undead subservient creatures bound to the heart of Lorcan, which is being exploited by Dagoth Ur. And um, I mean, the Black Shroud, the River of Fire, if we look at the ash storms as some sort of indicator of the storms which um, both Sauron and Morgoth, would, and Morgoth would use in order to ease the passing of the orcs as they spread over Beleriand or Middle-earth. Um, in this case, the heart of Lorcan uh, can represent the One Ring, the source of true dominion. Celebrimbor can be an aspect of Kagranach, uh, and essentially fashioning the tools that can be used to exploit this power, which will be corrupted by Sauron. And again, the ring to be used as a tool of domination, which is Dagofer's method of control. And I think uh, there, there is some legitimacy in saying the assumption of the heart as the ring, because of course, how does Morrowind end? Morrowind ends by destroying the heart of Lorcan, or at least disenchanting it, in the summit at the summit of at the summit of, um, of Red Mountain, in the same way that one destroys the ring uh, in the depths of Mount Doom. The three rings could relate to the elves. In this case along with other triad um, associations, the three elven rings and the leaders of the elves could link to the tribunal. And explicitly, the fading of the tribunal as representing the fading of the elves as they pass away back to the lands of, Al back to the lands of Alinor. The Battle of Red Mountain can represent the War of the Last Alliance, essentially, the first council war and the battle and the first council war the ghost fence the magical superstructure which guards around red mountain to prevent the blight covering all of vardenfell which is only sustained through the combined energies of the tribunal can represent melian's girdle the great magic wall which surrounded Thingol's domain in the realm of Doriath and protected it from marauding orcs coming from Amband. Indeed, if you look at the trajectory of the Silmarillion, the walls of Beleriand focus around a 400-year siege of 
the great mountain fiery fortress of Angband, which is essentially the situation that we've had, the stalemate that we've had um, in Morrowind. The tribunal gods aren't powerful enough to take the war to Digofo directly, but they can sustain him through a process of long siege, albeit like we see with Morgoth, Degofo is becoming stronger and the besiegers are becoming weaker. Indeed, if we look at the eruption of Red Mountain in the Red Year, as I said earlier, destruction of Beleriand, we can look at Sunda, uh, the Great Hammer is representing uh, Morgoth's Grond, uh, the fall of Ingolfin, uh, the various evil creatures coming out of Angband, such as Gothmog, um, he could be some sort of indicator of Akula Khan. And indeed, in terms of understanding Almalexia, I've already said that Almalexia and Vishnu, sorry, Vivek, are essentially examples of how one copes with the loss of divinity, whether one does so with pragmatism and grace and ultimately wisdom, as encapsulated in Vishnu. Sorry, Vivek, I'm going to continue. Obviously, the illusion is there. It's very obvious. And Almalexia, who does so through madness. Well, I'm instantly again assumed in terms of the Lord of, Ring and Lord of the Rings analogies that Denifor could be a source of Almalexia's insanity. Denifor, who is full knowledge of the power of Degofor, who has tried to stymie the growth of the forces of Sauron, who is, however, threatened by the return of the king. And who would the return of the king be in this case against Almalexia? It would be the Nereverine. And the tragedy of Morrowind, of course, is that the Nereverine is the reincarnation of her own husband to compound that tragedy. In terms of this representing a end, you can say, of Dunmeri civilization, I'm reminded of a video I published last year, which is that of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the dream of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the four kingdoms, the four kingdoms as representative by a great statue or iron giant. First, they represent the golden age of Resdane. And finally, you can say the iron kingdom of the tribunal and ultimately the demise of the earthly kingdoms and the coming of some sort of earthly paradise, or in this case would be the uh, the coming of the second, the second coming of Jesus and the final coming of the kingdom of God. And this would relink again back to the idea of Azura and prophecy, the priesthood of Baal and Elijah and Azura heralding the coming of the Messiah. And I think, I mean, I can't help, I mean, <laughs> looking at Akula Khan, it seems so obvious that it does seem like a parable from uh, uh, from the prophecy of Daniel. I mean, just the usage of a statue as emblematic of the decline and fall of Dunmeri civilization and the passage of various regimes, uh, which would ultimately represent the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven equivalent in Morrowind would be the restoration of the power of Azura i.e. the reclamations, albeit it doesn't go as uh, <laughs> quite as planned when it comes to a, uh, a vision of bliss and paradise. And that is because the Daedra are not a all-powerful and all-loving uh, all entity, a series of all-powerful, all-loving entities. Rather, they are amoral and fundamentally self-serving. Yes, Azura has brought back her religion over the Dunmeri people, but at what cost? Essentially, the destruction of the Dunmeri state, um, which is why the ending of Morrowind is so bittersweet. There's also another aspect to this, which isn't just Azura. There's also an aspect of where does the where do the nine divines uh, figure into all of this? Because I mentioned the imperial cult. They don't just represent an aspect of the politics of world building, but they also represent an aspect of prophecy because the Nereverine can receive a blessing from an aspect of Talos at the ghost gate before moving off to defeat Dagoth Ur. So in addition to receiving direction from Azura, it is also gaining sanctification from Talos. And for Talos, Talos, as with Azura, this could be entirely self-serving. Dagoth Ur represents some sort of great unraveling plan against his own legacy, which is the perpetuation of the Septim dynasty, not just through Morrowind, but also through Tamriel. So there is a legitimacy within the context of Morrowind, 
but there is also a legitimacy within the context of the greater situation in Tamriel that Dagoth Ur is a greater threat that must be stopped by essentially the combined might of the Adra in the case of Talos and Daedra in the case of Azura. Going back to the actual demise of Dagoth Ur and his corruption, I mean, on the one hand, this is so obviously linked to Arthurian legend. You can look at the battle between the original battle between Dagoth Ur and even the subsequent battle between Dagoth Ur and Nerevar and the Nerevarine as a analogy towards the Battle of Camlam, whereby Arthur fought against Mordred um, and was mortally wounded in that. In the case of the original battle, Nerevar dies. But in the case of the Nerevarine, as we find out in Oblivion, he goes on an expedition to Akavir and is never heard from since. That could in many ways represent Arthur's retreat to Avalon. So now we come to the Blight itself in terms of, in terms of historical analogies and mythical analogies, I have a few. One is going back to my Aztec through line which is the blight as being an analogy to the extension of smallpox. The extension of smallpox, which of course comes with the conquistadors, which in this case wouldn't be the empire, but would represent Quetzalcoatl, i.e. the original war god in the contest, the dualistic conception of the Nereverine versus Dagoth Ur. The prevalence of disease in Chinese philosophy is also an indicator for the loss of the mandate of heaven. So the blight is in itself a symptom of a divine loss of favor, a contest, contesting of the legitimacy of the tribunal for their inability to control the blight. In terms of more Lord of the Rings comparisons, I'm thinking of the Morgul blade. I also draw comparison to the chapter in Return of the King, which is the House of Healing that the blight has many has many allusions to the black breath. Uh, just to quote from that, when the black breath blows and death's shadows grows and all light passes. From here, I want to talk a bit about what I believe should be an alternative ending for Morrowind, because that is essentially the end of the story now that Dagofo has been defeated. But I think a lot of frustration regarding the actual sort of ending of Morrowind is the fact that the sixth house is sort of dealt with so unceremoniously after having been built up as such a powerful threat. Essentially, Dagofer is able to control the minds of the population, essentially turning ordinary Dunmer into Manchurian candidates, sleeping agent, sleeper agents, who will just go around and murder people without any sort of... Um, uh, knowledge or state of consciousness as exhibited by the presence of uh, the evil sort of talisman, which are the ash statues. He provides immortality to his subjects, but at a great cost of physical corruption. In the case of the images here, the ascended sleepers, the most grotesque abomination of Degofor, um, and of course the ash ghouls. Yes, they are completely evil, but within a role-playing game, the sixth house offers so many opportunities in terms of a genuinely evil player um, to wreak havoc on the world. And the limitations of role-playing in Morrowind basically mean you are stuck within the context of the heroic archetype. Uh, someone in the chat saying smallpox did not take down civilization. No, yes, I know, but it was a major contributor um, to mass death um, within not just the Aztec Empire, but all of pre-Columbian civilization. Again, as an analogy, I do believe there's some weight to it, but obviously nothing is perfect because Morrowind isn't entirely derivative, which is its strength. So how do I believe the game can take a fundamental turn and actually allow Nerevar to change its course? and stray away from prophecy because I, i've talked about this con this uh contest within morrowind which is that of the determinism of prophecy and that of free will well is it that nerevar contests and is able to defeat degofor because he is nerevar or is it he is the Nerevarine because he defeats Degofur? 
after completing the path of the incarnate and basically being sent by Azura to go off and uh, gather the various houses and Ashlander tribes as Hortator and Nereverine, you have the ghosts of previous wannabe incarnates, all of whom have failed the test. So there is a meta commentary within Morrowind that the Nereverine is not necessarily the Nereverine, but simply fulfills these completely arbitrary qualifiers. And ultimately, the, pr the proof of the Nereverine is in the act and not in terms of these superficial symbols. These superficial symbols are significant enough for Uriel Septim, the emperor, to actually take the player character and place them in a situation where they may act as a useful agent of imperial interest by putting down the threat of Dagofer, which is threatening the entire empire. But because there is this lingering aspect of doubt regarding whether the Nereverine is actually prophesized to bring about the, aid of the era of Dagofer, the player can represent that true manifestation of will as opposed to deterministic prophecy and as simply being an agent of Azura, either wittingly or unwittingly, and become a power associated with Dagofer. And this wouldn't be, this would be a, um, <sighs> a rekindling of an old alliance uh, between the two powers. Um, obviously, Dagofer is a bit insane. I think there are many aspects of Gollum um, associated with Dagofer and the paralyzing control of the One Ring. But nevertheless, Dagofer, throughout the course of the game, offers many sort of uh, olive branches. And just to read one, once we were friends and brothers, Lord Nerevar, in peace and in war, no houseman ever served you better or more faithfully. Much that I did was at your command, a great cost to myself and my honour. Yet beneath Red Mountain, you struck me down as I guarded the treasure you bound me by my oath to defend. It was a cruel blow and a bitter betrayal to be felled by your hand. But remembering our old friendship, I would forgive you and raise you high in my service. In this situation, the Dagoth would convince the Nereverine to wage war on the temple and spread the influence of the sixth house, the house unmourned. And indeed, the sixth house can go on to establish a presence beyond that of the ghost gate. The Nereverine can go off and become an assassin, removing hostile actors. Indeed, as we see when the Nereverine is uh, faced off against all the Stren having switched sides, the role of the Nereverine can actually be to induce various actors within Morrowind to flip like all the Stren. Indeed, the tribunal extension can actually play out differently if we link this back with the sick house essentially having the ability to co-opt Helseth, given the fact that Helseth is opposed to Almalexia and even the Nereverine, um, there could be a tantalizing prospect in an alliance between the sick house and Helseth. Indeed, it'll be interesting to see the presence of the sick house in the broader expansion of Mournhold. Um, indeed, in terms of a game concession, there'll be a interesting incentive in terms of when once you join with the forces of the sixth house it would basically have to cut off all of your links with all of the other guilds the imperial legion the cult the temple uh the major guild, thieves guild etc because none of these organizations can acquiesce to the power and the goals of dagofer which like i said dagofer is bent on complete and total domination using the Akula Khan um, as a vessel of conquest in terms of inverting Tiber Septim's conquest, the hands of Numidium. And there's already a precedent within Morrowind for that, which are the vampire clans. If you become a vampire in Morrowind, you become exceptionally powerful, but you're basically cut off from interacting with the mainstream of Morrowind um, ever again. So in this case, this would be the vampire situation in Morrowind, but writ large. And I believe it's a failing of um, Morrowind's world building to be able to do that. But in fairness to Morrowind, I mean, I've gone over, I've gone over so much in terms of the intricacies, complexities and brilliance of the world building, all of the inspirations, all of the themes, the unreliable narrator reading history into it, prophecy versus uh, the will to power. Um, this is, I, I believe, entirely due to the limitations of time uh, and resources dedicated to Morrowind. And indeed, one of my motivations 
in doing this stream is that Starfield has recently come out. And I think Starfield has proven to everyone that Bethesda is morally, is creatively, not morally, creatively bankrupt, maybe morally bankrupt. Uh, Bethesda cannot create an engaging world anymore. They can't even design an interesting world again. Um, and the most depressing thing about Starfield is that Starfield is the complete inverse of Morrowind. Morrowind was a project undertaken by a tiny team under massive time constraints, um, which essentially the whole, whole sort of future of Bethesda was dependent on the success of Morrowind. And so there was a huge amount of pressure in terms of being able to pull it off, which I believe they did marv marvelously. Not necessarily in terms of making the game accessible to a larger audience, which is you know the Achilles heel of things like Skyrim, but in terms of building one of the most incredible worlds you know possible within a video game. Take Starfield. Starfield is the complete inverse of that. Todd Howard had all the resources, all the time, everything he had, which was non-existent in Morrowind. And look at the result. So if anything, Morrowind represents art from adversity and Starfield represents hubris. Um, I mean, I mean, there's really nothing more you can really say from it other than the man who has become so disconnected that he's fundamentally sort of uh, become alienated from his original vision uh, is a fall from grace. So looking at Morrowind, I don't believe you're ever going to get the game like this again. And the tragedy is that the money is there and the, the graphics, uh, the creativity is all there. Uh, it simply requires a studio to take risks in the same way that Morrowind was a huge risk. But like I said, with the trajectory of Elder Scrolls, I think Starfield basically... Uh, determined that the Elder Scrolls 6, which I assume is going to be in Hammerfell, uh, is going to be a complete disaster. And I think after Starfield, everyone has become apathetic about the Elder Scrolls 6, uh, which given which given the um, success of Skyrim seems almost inconceivable that Skyrim sequel would be, you know, everyone has already assumed it's going to be terrible. Um, but I think that's going to be the case with the Elder Scrolls VI. I mean, the only thing Bethesda had going for them before Starfield was the environmental storytelling. And they gutted that in order to create incredibly bland, procedurally generated worlds. And I mean, Howard and uh, Rolston and Kirkbride, they took an existing IP and they made it spellbinding. But of course, with all the creative powers to create a new IP with Starfield, they, sp they failed spectacularly. But anyway, that's my tangent over. Getting back to a form of epilogue for Morrowind, um, I want to mention the Tribunal because I've already alluded to Almalexia as being a parallel to Vivek. Um, in terms of the inspirations for Mournhold, I mean, Mournhold is very distinct from the rest of Vardenfell, which it should be because it is the mainland and it's not within close proximity of Red Mountain. Um, Alexia's temple is obviously very much inspired by uh, Indo-Chinese architecture, uh, just looking at the stupas of Burma um, and comparing it here. Um, indeed, you can say there are a lot of um, uh, Chinese and generally sort of Thai uh, Vietnamese influences, uh, Burmese influences wedded to the architecture here. And I've already mentioned King Helseth, so I'm not going to um, bring up all these aspects here. Um, unless people want me to sort of go over the intricacies of the world building, I think um, Mournhold was essentially the template from which to build the Imperial City. And I think mechanically, it brought in a lot of facts that would actually hamper future games, such as the loss of levitation as a skill, uh, closed environments, 
um, which essentially meant that, unlike a Morrowind, Morrowind is wonderful in the sense that with the exception of the internal cantons of Vec, uh, you can go everywhere and don't have to be faced with loading screens. But I think Morrowind is basically the transition from, sorry, Tribunal is the transition from Morrowind to Oblivion in that sense. But nevertheless, I think what Tribunal provides is a fantastic conclusion to the Goethe Dammering of the Tribunal. Vivek doesn't even need to feature in this because Vivek has already tacitly acknowledged the necessity of the Nereverine by bequeathing him Wraithguard, the tool which allows the Nereverine to use Sunder and Keening to destroy the heart of Lorcan. But Almalexia essentially uses this opportunity to connive and attempt to establish a new monotheistic temple under her own direction. And not only does she attempt to supplant the Reverine, who has now basically become the greatest contest to her own legitimacy, but she murders Sofa Sil, the other member of the tribunal, and very clearly has intentions to go off and kill Vivek once she's done with the Nereverine. There are limitations in terms of the complexity of Almalexia's betrayal, and I think this is due to the fact that tribunal can be taken place before you defeat the main quest in um, Morrowind, um, because I really think they should have lent on Almalexia's previous relationship with Nerevar. And indeed, Almalexia could be a great ve vehicle in terms of understanding the Battle of Red Mountain from a different perspective, and how she herself dealt with the betrayal of the Oath. Um, because unlike Vivek and Sofa Sil, who are very solitary characters, Almalexia revels in her godlike status. She is see, she is the most obvious member of the tribunal, and she is loved for it. Uh, she is the protector, but she's also the most generous of the arms of e. And so a wonderful touch, I thought, at the end of the tribunal expansion, when Armalexia betrays you, and has having murdered Sofa Sil, is that when you have defeated Armalexia, you leave the tribunal temple and you tell people that Amalexia is dead. And the concept is just so foreign to these people because she has been the rock of religious life in Morrowind for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, a goddess is dead. It is inconceivable to these people, and they all react the same way. You must be mistaken. And of course, that is essentially the end of the tribunal. We never have a definitive ending for what happens to Vivek, but we see the erasure of Vivek's legacy, which is the crashing of the Ministry of Truth into the city. And as we saw with the lessons, Vivek himself considered his city to be an extension of himself and his will made manifest throughout Vardenfell. So for all intents and purposes with the destruction of the city, Vivek himself was dead. But of course, the tragedy is Nerevar and Nerevar doesn't become the new god king of Morrowind. He doesn't establish the position of Generalissimo Hortator, uh, which was the original, essentially, uh, political structure around the Battle of Red Mountain. In the same way, having won the second Battle of Red Mountain, he ceases to be a factor anymore. And this is probably one of the most uh, controversial um, facets uh, regarding um, the legacy of Morrowind. When it comes to Oblivion, uh, Oblivion barely makes any reference to the events in Morrowind other than passing lines like the idea of the uh, Nerevering going off to an expedition to Akavir. But at the beginning of Skyrim, you find out things which are quite disturbing if you are very much invested in Dunmeri culture and law, which is that following the collapse of the mainstream political structure, House Drez, which is the mainland house of Morrowind, which is also uh, the great slave-owning house outside of House Telvani, uh, is attacked by Argonians operating out of Argonia or Black Marsh. And to my mind, this is very much, it's basically the writers wanting to create the Haitian revolution 
um, in the situation of Morrowind. And I think, again, the writers despise this aspect of uh, Dunmerry culture. And so they gave the Argonians not only a, a major stat buff when it came to their, uh, their basically uh, their drug-induced, uh, hist-induced stupor, where they went out and actually invaded Oblivion itself to the point that uh, Meru and Stagon had to close down um, the Oblivion gates. But they then went on to create Morrowind's version of the Haitian Revolution. And to make matters worse, not only do they destroy Vivek, they also erupt Red Mountain. So by the beginning of Skyrim, you have the legacy of hundreds of years of refugees. And to me, what the writers of Skyrim did is they destroyed Morrowind to make a political point about Alfred Stormcloak and an inclusive, racially diverse Skyrim. And I think that's really tragic. And I think the only way that Skyrim redeemed this slightly was by bringing back Solstheim. time. If anything, I believe the Dragonborn extension in Skyrim was a bit of an apology <laughs> for the way that uh, Morrowind was so horrifically treated in the law, because you have the first inklings of an attempt to rebuild which is done through the vehicle of House Redoran. House Redoran, who have adopted the anticipations now as the reclamations, Mephala, Boethia, and Azura. And you see the political workings of Redoran. You see that House Halalu has been completely and utterly discredited due to their association with the Empire. There was an attempt for the descendants of a faction of House Lalu to take over Raven Rock. Um, which they failed to do so with the intercession of the player. And you're also allowed to meet Master Nelov, uh, who lived in Sage of Mora during the events of Morrowind. Um, if anything, I actually believe that the structure around the side quests in Raven Rock and uh, the Telvani Tower in Sol's time was probably the best thing that... Uh, Skyrim ever created that may be quite controversial but maybe again that's due to uh, my love of Morrowind and the culture there and all the dragonborn aspects were actually the weakest parts of that um, but nevertheless like I said I think there was some form of an apology to deal with the way the Dumbers were treated and I think it was also a an olive branch to the Morrowind fans that they could relive that world once again in the same way that I believe that uh, the Shivering Isles also represented that in terms of the oblivion. It seems quite um <laughs> it seems quite fascinating in a way, doesn't it, that both Oblivion and Skyrim need to make expansions which seem apologetic about the fact that they've deviated so far away from Morrowind. Um and as someone is basically saying in the chat, yes, um, if anything, what happened to what happened to Morrowind after the events of the game prove that Degofo was actually right. And um, the, like I said, it is Spenglerian in the sense that it is a tale of the decline and fall of civilization. And the decline only accelerates after the corrective measure of Nerevar. And it is a story of the decline and fall of the gods. What could have been a very positive message with the advent of Nerevar um, I think that's a good way to actually leave Morrowind and the question of Dumber civilization. But of course, the writers couldn't leave well enough alone. And in subsequent games, they use the law to basically discredit the positive vision which emanated out of the conclusion of Morrowind. And I think that's a, a major creative failing. And if anything, it's just one middle finger to the Morrowind fans, which if anything, Oblivion and Morrowind are middle fingers to the Morrowind fans. I mean, someone is saying that Skyrim lore is weak compared to Morrowind. Well, what Oblivion has going for it is the Daedric invasions. The problem is it's carried out incompetently. Uh, I mean, you can bring, flesh out Merian Stagon because he appeared in Morrowind, and you can perhaps bring in other, introduce other Daedric gods outside of the corner of the House of Troubles, because of course we already know about Sheagorath. We already know about Merian Stagon. You can say, for example, bring back 
people like Mer like uh, Merlag Bao tentatively, but you know, why didn't say, for example, we get more to do with the Mina? Why didn't we have more to do with Namira um, or some of the other, or even uh, Meridia? I mean, the good thing you can say about the Knights of the Nine expansion is that at least Meridia had some sort of flavor regarding um, Umaril the Unfeathered and the Aurorans. But um, Oblivion was supposed to be a game about the contest of the Septim dynasty against Daedric invasions and the return to the Merithic era. I mean, just compare Mankar Cameron to Dagor Fur and compare the Mythic Dawn to the Sixth House. There's basically no competition. And what could have been a very interesting concept, a very uh, grandiose concept, which actually feeds from, uh, you can say, the... Uh, the career of Uriel Septim and his uh, quiet politicking. I mean, he doesn't make any sort of appearance in Morrowind like he does in Daggerfall, but in Morrowind, it's very clear that he has an inf influence and it's a very subtle, but it's also a very clever influence regarding using the Nereverine myth as a potential way to outfox and destroy a threat Dagor for and he ultimately achieves it. But ultimately the emperor dies at the beginning of Oblivion and all of that intrigue and interest in the character is also destroyed because he's left no succession plan. So the Oblivion plot can only continue because the Blades are incompetent, which they weren't in Morrowind, and the Emperor had no succession plan. So, I mean, that's before I even talk about the, um, the simplified world building. I mean, they took the lore conception of Cyrodiil and made it a generic high fantasy setting. They took the cultural clashes within the Nibane regions and the Colovian regions, they made the culture homogenous. They essentially made all the counties the same, even with the same architecture. And as she props to Skyrim, Skyrim was able to recreate a bit of the decentralized, decentralized culture of Morrowind through creating essentially independent yardums and the orcish strongholds um but i think again what the the lesson is from morrowind is that morrowind was so ambitious and with every iteration bethesda takes the wrong lessons becomes less ambitious i mean take vivek for example as i even mentioned in terms of the law concept as a law concept as a historical analogy and as a city itself you know vivek is grand it is impressive um but it fails in many ways because of the system of travel in morrowind i mean i love the system of travel in morrowind but it essentially it's nadir is reach when it comes to vivek because it's so difficult to get around vivek and vivek is so huge but also vivek is so homogenous so it's very difficult to find yourself or find any sort of identifiable sort of uh um, characters or shops or anything like that in Vivek, it becomes uh, very samey, you can very easily get lost. And so what they did is dumb it down when it came to Tribunal and Morrowin and Mournhold. Mournhold, which I believe is far more simplified than Vivek. And Mournhold then proved to be the template for the Imperial City, which was much smaller than Vivek. And then we go from the Imperial City to Solitude, which is basically the size of about two districts of the Imperial City. So in all of these aspects, the Elder Scrolls game becoming far less ambitious. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that's me yammering on enough. Uh, I think I will finally get to the super chats. Um, there's only so much I'm afraid that I can do in terms of uh, uninterrupted monologuing for um, three and a half hours. All right. Well, I just want to mention, because people are going on this in terms of Oblivion being dumbed down. I mean, Oblivion doesn't feel like a realistic um, a realistic setting, unlike Morrowind. I mean, it's a shame because Oblivion has a major innovation on Morrowind, which is Oblivion has radiant AI. I mean, one of the most depressing things about Morrowind is basically all the characters are static. They don't sleep. They don't alter their schedules. They basically remain stuck in place forever, which is why I believe um, thievery in Morrowind was so bland. But 
because of the rich world building, because of the economy, not just the economy, but the unique economy. I mean, ebony smuggling, you know, moon sugar, quama eggs, <laughs> which are basically the only resource that Vardenfeld can produce. Um, and that and all the intrigue. The economy and the world building of Morrowind felt completely unique in the same way that many of the quests involved the great houses would actually go around and have you sort of busting up um, uh, smuggling dens and things like that. In other words, bandits had a purpose in Morrowind. There was a reason bandit organizations exist. But take that, and despite all the advances in Radiant AI, which should really flesh out Oblivion and make it so much more immersive than Morrowind, and then you turn the population and make two thirds of them generic enemies. I mean, every single fort outside a city in Oblivion, with I think the ex exception of uh, Skyhaven Temple, not Skyhaven Temple, um, Cloud Ruler Temple, uh, is occupied by bandits or undead or conjurers or whatever. There are very few random so sort of prescripted events you can find on the road, and as and also there's very little in terms of an economy. I mean, you know, where are all the major farms? Yeah, there are a couple outside Skingrad. But all in all, you feel that Skyrim doesn't really have any economy. You don't really feel that there's any interaction. And also because they got rid of fast, they got rid of, um, uh, they introduced fast travel rather, uh, there is no way for the characters to actually get around diegetically uh, other than by uh, using horses, which was again, one innovation that uh, Oblivion brought over Morrowind. Um, and of course, Morrowind, was able to be so immersive because there were so many ways of getting around. There was teleportation, there was boat travel, um, there were silt striders. You know, silt striders in particular being a exceptional part of the uniqueness of um, Morrowind's world building. All of that was cut out in Skyrim. And indeed, just, just think about this. The entire plot of Oblivion, the entire plot of Oblivion could have been avoided had the Emperor used teleportation magic which existed in Morrowind a few years earlier. I mean, if that's if anything's going to break your immersion, that is. I, I mean, it's just remarkable. And of course, going from Morrowind and therefore entering into Oblivion is so jarring. And it should be noted that Oblivion was my first Elder Scrolls game. And so it occupies a very nostalgic place for me. But mechanically, I can basically say it ruined the Elder Scrolls series. I mean, I will always love the um, the NPC conversations. I mean, they're basically, you know, branded, you know, branded in my mind for all eternity. Um, the sort of quaint, happy, upper middle class mindset of all the NPCs in Oblivion, and all the um, the bizarre sort of uh, dialogue and things like that. I mean, it's just um, it's very cute. Uh, but like I said, none of the mechanical complexity of Intrigue of Morrow and all of that was stripped out. So anyway, I mean, I take my example about the diegetic storytelling and the economy and bandits existing for a reason. More, um, I believe... Uh, the developers in Morrowind, despite all the limitations that were placed on them and time, they had the ability to name individual bandits. Whereas not only are bandits omnipresent when it comes to Oblivion and Skyrim, but of course there's no attempt to name them or give them a purpose there. So all of this is going to illustrate, because I am rambling, but um, it's rambling with a, some sort of purpose, is Morrowind is so above its successors. And indeed, I, I think Daggerfall, but Daggerfall has more complex um, uh, world building. But I, again, I, I have no interest in replaying Daggerfall because it's so antiquated i mean you know i can deal with morrowind because its mechanics are so sophisticated but i can't go back and deal with daggerfall but um no it's just it's just sad looking at all the potential complexity and the brilliance of the world building of morrowind I'm, i am i'm in awe um and like i said i can read so much history and mythology into it um but i find almost skyrim and oblivion unplayable uh by comparison and for people who want, because I, I think a lot of you are going to be Skyrim players and far fewer of you are going to be Morrowind players. Uh, there is a stream I did with Al Tori, and it's on his channel, Al Tori, uh, which goes over the politics and world building 
uh, of Skyrim. I mean, I have quite a derogatory view of it, but if you want my opinions of that, it's some of it is on that stream. And as you can probably tell, I have no desire to give <laughs> Oblivion and Skyrim the sort of treatment I've given Morrowind because it simply isn't there. Um, I can't read something into it that isn't there. Um, so there we are. Anyway, finally onto the Super Chats. Uh, before we begin, Nerevar, if you don't mind, I will take 30 seconds to a minute to give you a short reference to the historical background of the Dhamma. Yeah, I recently did a stream uh, on Putin's interview with Tucker Carlson, and some some brilliant soul went out and recreated the Tucker-Putin interview, but made him take the interview in Red Mountain and made Tucker interview uh, Degofor. And essentially, Degofo has the same uh, long-winded historical approach to answering questions, and I very much appreciated that. I think Zood, uh, for five dollars, that is the um, the original reference uh, that you're making there. But it's very much appreciated. The gunslinger for ten dollars. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, the Nereverine approaches. I wonder what form he'll take. Perhaps a farm boy, hunk American, or a strong, chiselled African. <laughs> Maybe a twonky Asian. Um, and Degofo will say, what the hell is this? Um, and in this case, the Nereverine is a Brit. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a bit, when it actually comes to the role-playing aspects, I mean, it can be very jarring that you can be any race in Morrowind and you have to conform to a Dunma savior archetype. I mean, just the irony, say, for example, if uh, Nerevar were an Argonian, <laughs> just putting it out there. Uh, so thank you, Gunslinger. Uh, Richard Kuduk for $9.99. Thank you very much. Uh, Long-term fan. Finally had a chance to catch a live stream. Keep up the good work. Well, uh, thank you, Richard. I'm glad you finally found a chance to uh, catch me live. Uh, the Gunslinger again. Uh, the Boondocks. Yes. Uh, I don't really want to go into this too much, but uh, yeah, I, I do love the uh, the slur Enoir. I'll just put it that. <laughs> Um, Faith Knight for ten dollars. Uh, do you see a corollary between the disappearance of the Dwemer and the biblical Tower of Babel, uh, powering the Numidium and their hubris in reaching godhood, causing their dispersion? Um, other than the fact that their dispersion wasn't caused by some sort of act of God, I mean, if you read into Vivek and believe that he's telling the truth, which he isn't, then yes, that <laughs> you can say that Vivek is reading that through the sermons. He is wanting to give the impression to the viewer that the Dwemer did achieve some form of um, uh, Tower of Babel analogy. And that was the cause of their dispersion, that it acted as some form of divine retribution. So ironically, you can read that analogy into Vivek's revisionist history itself, but within the law, it's within the actual um, real events outside of historical revisionism. I'm afraid you can't read that, but nevertheless, it's very interesting you bring up that point because Vivek would agree with you. Uh, so thank you, Faith Knight. Uh, John the Average for $20. Uh, thank you for another amazing stream. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, Faith Knight again. Uh, to think I'd, I had all the law figured out prior to the stream. Uh, what a grand and intoxicating innocence. Uh, what is your favorite build and which great house do you favor the most? Well, I only had a couple of days to go back and uh, get a feel of Morrowind after I decided to uh, do this stream. Um, I decided to create a high elf warrior. And the reason I actually picked a high elf is because first of all, the high elves get all the uh, magicka buffs. And then I pick the Atronarch stone, sorry, the Atronarch birth sign. And because of that, I absorb most of my magicka, which means most of the negative effects coming with a high elf and their weakness to magicka are negated. Um, and with the high elf's magic, I then go off and I become very proficient in mysticism magic. And as a consequence of that, I can use the fast travel and teleportation system very adeptly. So it doesn't sort of um, act as a grind on my play style. Um, and indeed, I also become an alchemist to mindly augment my abilities. But in terms of my my playthrough, uh, I decided to go for House Redoran uh, because House Redoran, I, I haven't actually played House Redoran. I, I obviously I know the law. Um, but I felt no incentive to play House Redoran. I usually always play uh, either House Lalu or House Telvani. Uh, so I went through that uh, 
so I went through that for uh, the sake of all of you. And uh, I mean, like I said, I I always love to play a wizard in Morrowind, and the experience of playing a Telvanni wizard in Morrowind is like nothing you'll get in the subsequent Elder Scrolls games, right? And obviously, Telvanni is my most favorite house. Uh, Campion Pisate for uh, I think that's ten krona. Thank you very much. Uh, for anyone interested, there's a mod in the works that uh, adds AI voices to NPCs called Voices of Vardenfell. It is 60% complete as of now. Well, I mean, uh, that is a great sort of innovation in terms of immersion. I mean, one of the reasons I feel very nostalgic towards Oblivion is that it's voice acted, and the voice acting is so memorable, uh, in particular the male elven voices. Um, as a result, you can feel a disconnect when doing quests, and it takes quite a lot of sort of... Um, uh, imagination and investment in terms of you being able to recreate the characters out of the script. But as a result of the script, you're allowed to get into so much depth. And what has Bethesda done ever since Morrowind? Uh, it has made the dialogue far more streamlined and they keep adding more voice acting and dumbing down the dialogue. I mean, the last Bethesda game I've actually played is Fallout 4. And need I say more? Right, Dimitri Garlic for $10. What do you think of the conflict between liberal democracy and Frederican absolutism as portrayed in the classic anime Legend of the Galactic Heroes? Uh, do you prefer Young or Reinhardt? I have no idea what you're talking about, um, Dimitri Garlic, but thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, Marcel, who I don't know what currency that is, but thank you. Uh, dig off aim. Not farewell, sweet Nerevar. Better luck on your next incarnation. <laughs> next mod, anyone, please. And thank you, AM. Uh, yeah, I mean... I'm always interested to see an alternative history, an alternative uh, Morrowind scenario in which Degofa wins. Um, especially if you're some sort of a rabid Morrowind nationalist. Um, if you have to find the uh, the end of the tribunal, then uh, and you want to preserve uh, and preserve a uh, Morrowind culture, even at the cost of uh, losing your soul and becoming uh, nothing more than a, a mindless automaton, then obviously uh, Degofa is the uh, the person for you. But like I said, in a role playing game, a brilliant opportunity for evil characters to thrive. And indeed, I think can, you can actually take this with the tribunal extension. The tribunal extension ends with Almalexia betraying Nere the Nerevarine. Well, wouldn't it be brilliant if the Dagoth Ur alternative path would actually end with Dagoth Ur betraying you again? And maybe that would actually shed some light in terms of the progress of the Battle of Red Mountain um, in taking the evil path and seeing how Dagoth Ur would interact with you. And so the end of the evil path of Morrowind would actually see you taking, um, taking Dagoth Ur's place and maybe leaving off with the question of what you're going to do with the Kula Khan. But obviously the mechanics of Morrowind could never allow you to actually do anything with the Kula Khan, but nevertheless the question would be raised as to would you go off and conquer Tamriel with it. And of course with the lore you have uh, Dragon Breaks and the Warp in the West, so all of these things can happen and none of them can happen, depending on whatever explanation you're going to use to wave it away. Uh, the Venerable Bede for $10. Thank you very much. Apostolic Gamer, thank you for all the work you do, AM. Uh, well, I'm not really a gamer. I mean, um, this is basic. Most of this is me just going off memory and fumes and uh, going through all these sort of research books um, because I haven't. I, I, I try and make an effort of playing Morrowind sort of once, every, um, once every year and starting a new character. Um, but I, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't really have the setup to be a gamer, I'm afraid. Uh, and of a DOS cover for, uh, I, I don't know what currency that is, but thank you very much. Uh, Fantastico, Sarah. Blessings on you and your house. Thank you for this fantastic evening. P.S. House Dress is the greatest of the great houses. Yeah, there's actually, because I, I went over all the concept art for this, and there is so much cool concept art. Uh, when it comes to house dress. Um, and indeed, it's very strange that you can't really interact with House Inderal. House Inderal being the great ordinator house because you are Inderal Nerevar. <laughs> um, but again, like I said, time limitations and all that. And um, I mean, I, I don't exactly know what house dress could have added because the, the good thing about Telvani, Halalu, and Redoran is in mirroring the uh, Imperial guilds. They basically allow you to fulfill the RPG archetypes. 
I'm not really sure what house Drez would have really offered, but like I said, any sort of contributions to the law. I mean, the the ultimate experience would be if all of Morrowind were playable, not just Vardenfell and Mournhold, but um, alas, no. I mean, the funny thing is, yes, Vardenfell is smaller than Skyrim or Oblivion, but relative, Vardenfell is actually massive compared to the other sizes of those places. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that the Imperial province is uh, comparative to the small island in the middle of Morrowind called Vardenfell, but there we are. AGSJ for $5. I have nothing to say, just throwing my love and support as always. Well, thank you very much. Uh, C for $5. I don't play this game. However, I support this channel. Well, I, I don't know. I think you need to play this game really in terms of being able to understand this, but I think, I hope for people who haven't played this game, you may be interested. I mean, it is quite difficult to immerse yourself because of things like hit chance and of things like the slow movement speed, I think can put off quite a lot of players. But the minute you come to actually learn and understand the mechanics, it improves greatly. And like I said, um, hit chance was actually a brilliant way of being able to avoid enemies becoming nothing more than um, uh, sponges. But um, what was the word? Having just massive health bars. Um, there, there is a word for it. I'm, I'm forgetting it. A, a way to essentially describe enemies which are just big health bars and nothing else. Um, come on, anyone in the chat? Anyway, very. I'll, I'll say tanky. Um, uh, hit chance allows you essentially to have um, uh, a lot of nuance when it comes to combat, but of course... Oblivion took that, got rid of it, and made enemies basically invincible. They also took the superior leveling system in Morrowind and essentially destroyed the game <laughs> uh, to the point that you, you can only really enjoy the game in Oblivion without grinding by using exploits and cheats, which is, I mean, it's just, it's just horrific, but there we are. Um, the Gunslinger for $5. Uh, for the record, out of the three elf races that's playable in Elder Scrolls to this day, because of the very game I exclusively play Dark Elves, even in D&D. I mean, Wood Elves in this game are very meme -y. The first character you meet outside of the census office is uh, Fargoth. Um, and indeed, there's the Wood Elf character in Mournhold, uh, who demands you keep giving him more money to ridiculous proportions and then he comes out and uh, all decked in armor and tries to kill you. <laughs> uh, so uh, Wood Elves are very funny in both Oblivion and um, uh, Morrowind. And what do they do in Skyrim? They make them completely interchangeable with uh, High Elves. It's really a shame. Uh, Matt L for $5. Thank you again, AM, for another great stream. Any chance we'll get a mini series episode about your hopes for the next Elder Scrolls game? No. Like I said, Matt L, after Starfield, I think the entire sort of Bethesda coterie, because obviously, you know, I, I have, I have no attachment to any brand whatsoever. I'm not a fan in that sense. I am incredibly selective and critical of the things that I enjoy. And I will say, the thing is, I, I look at this, and obviously it's a guilty passion you know, in some senses. But like I said, if I can read so much out of this, then obviously there's some utility to it. And I hope there's some utility to people listening for it. But um, I mean, if you look at Starfield and just not just the incompetence of the um, the world building, but also just the weird dysgenic and um, the social commentary and things like that, and just the poverty of any sort of aspirations towards some sort of religious ideas. I mean, it really is like, um, what if what if um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, made a video game? You know, it really is sort of that science cliche. I mean, what's the word they use? NATO punk. Um, I, there's no way we're going to get anything which is even moderately interesting. I mean, if you think the social commentary in Skyrim is heavy handed, I mean, if it's set in Hammerfell, oh boy. TB88 for five dollars. Michael Kirkbride made the Tez 3 law. What, what it was he left by Oblivion? Um, he was an Oblivion. He wrote uh, the commentaries in the Mysterium Xarxes by Mankar Cameron. But as is everything indicative with Oblivion, it's just there really is very little in terms of being able to create a diverse world. 
um, a pluralistic world and oblivion it, to the point that it became an accessible and generic fantasy setting. Um, but again, I, I want to emphasize, you know, it's not just Kirkbride here. Uh, Ken Rolston was the lead designer. Uh, we have uh, Mark Nelson. Um, we have uh, Douglas Goodall. I mean, with Blood Moon, I mean, this is actually, we do even have uh, Emil Pagliarillo, uh, who is pretty much infamous now. Uh, George W. Hayduke for $10. Thank you very much. I've spent five years compiling material to make a video essay about Morrowind like this, and you've taken a few days and made a stream of it. Congratulations, Enwar. <laughs> I may yet, may, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Um, George Hayduke, if that really is the case, uh, I, I will admit, uh, humble bragging, this really was a spur of the moment thing. And just because I had a faint idea of it, well, there are two things, well, three things that contributed to making me do the stream. One uh, was seeing the memes around the Tucker Carlson interview, which I really enjoyed. Another was just believing that this had become the definitive Bethesda game after the catastrophe that was Starfield. And another really was that Franco stream and finding some sort of a distant analogy. <laughs> uh, but anyway, thank you. But I would encourage you to go and uh, make that Morrowind video because I do think it's worth it. And uh, the more people that actually become invested in um, everything that can be achieved in terms of uh, really immersive, complicated, and uh, uh, what's the word, transformative, um, well, uh, world building uh, in any sort of fancy setting, uh, whether it be a book, whether it be a film series, or whether it be a game. Um, I do think that this stream has hopefully um, put out the idea that um, video games can, given um, certain circumstances, actually be brilliant vehicles to the most in-depth and uh, immersive world, uh, world building, but uh, there we are. All right. That is the end of the super chat. So unless anyone else has uh, any sort of death, desperate questions to uh, uh, to ask me, um, I'm probably going to leave it there. Uh, just uh, Mr. Krieger in the chat. Uh, have you tried the Tamriel rebuilt mod? Uh, they've slowly been adding the rest of the province of Morrowind over the last 15 years. No, I haven't played. I, re I really haven't played any mods when it comes to uh, Morrowind, which, if anything, means that I have a very uh, purist, unadulterated perception when it comes to Morrowind, um, which is very interesting considering that Bethesda's new, or rather emerging, uh, business model is simply defined ways of allowing other people to fix and mod their games for them uh but that i didn't need that when it came to morrowind but um i also should mention that i had especially with veloth to um encounter elder scrolls online law when i did my research um but i really didn't go into that because i just wanted to focus on morrowind and of course eso isn't canon either um kutaro thanks for the stream man i had two questions Will you begin your Children of Albion series? Uh, I, I'm afraid as of now, um, a lot of the things I do seem to be more spur of the moment, to be honest. I, I've gone off the idea of doing long series. Um, you know, testament to why this isn't going to be a gaming series. This is going to be the only review, like Ardoranye, where I read history into a fictional setting. I may. I may cover the Lord of the Rings films in this much depth, comparing them, doing an assessment via adaption, but I, I just in general, I prefer the sort of one-off videos and I'm more interested in sort of generating and going towards conceptual history. I mean, I started doing my uh, Siglo de Oro, my Spanish Golden Age series, and uh, I really don't know if that's going to happen, but that would happen before the Children of Albion series. Right, unoriginal username, thank you very much for five pounds. Uh, was watching your Wilhelm the Second video while waiting to see Bill Bailey tonight. Thank you for the great content. Oh, that was a very, very long time ago, but I'm glad you enjoyed that video. Right. Any more streams like this and other fancy topics? No, like I said, um, uh, I think this is just going to be going to be one off. I think it'll be a very weird direction uh, for my channel uh, if you saw more content like this. 
Uh, however, Jacob in the chat has uh, said something very interesting, which is no Nietzschean analysis of Kreia. Um, I am interested in KOTOR, uh, especially KOTOR 2. Um, however, what I find frustrating about KOTOR 2 is the fact that the mechanics of the game aren't borne out by the philosophy of Kreia at all. I mean, just put this in perspective, so much of Kreia's philosophy pertains to molding a new form of Jedi out of the exile, i.e. she has to be the last Jedi in order to imprint a new series of teaching. And then in the final quest, you have to face off about a hundred Jedi. And someone's mentioning it's an unfinished game. Well, I have played the restored version. But there is, um, mechanically, there's just so much more that needs to be done to tweak it. But in theory, um, yes, I, I, th I think Kreia is a, a very interesting character I've always been interested in. And indeed, if anything, it just it goes on to expose how utterly horrifying a dumpster fire Disney Star Wars is when the expanded universe already had such a complex and nuanced stories uh, like KOTOR. But... Uh, it is an interesting suggestion. I'm sure other people are probably going to say, you know, why um, uh, are you going to cover uh, Fallout New Vegas? Uh, I won't cover the other Fallout games because I believe Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 are abominations. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to Fallout New Vegas, I mean, I, I part of the reason I did this stream is because... I, a stream like this may exist somewhere on the internet or a video may exist somewhere like the internet, but I've never seen a Morrowind breakdown which went into the historical analogies and culture like this. I mean, probably the the best video on Morrowind that's out there is uh, the one on Patrician TV. Um, I think that eight hour video has done a lot in terms of being able to bring people back over to uh, Morrowind fandom. Um, but, you know, having, again, this is all going off quite a long time ago, but um, a lot of the stuff I've covered here, I think, is uh, stuff which hopefully is original and uh, hasn't appeared on uh, on any other channels and part of the you know, sincere motivation for me doing this. Uh, however, I think with New Vegas, New Vegas has been covered extensively um, when it comes to the world building. Uh, so I don't really feel I have anything to add. I mean, a lot of people may be that genuinely interested in which faction I would choose in Fallout New Vegas, um, because that's a fascinating sort of moral and philosophical question. Um, I'm sure I get the impression that uh, there is a certain based option, but I wouldn't necessarily agree with you. Um, Uh, Jacob is saying Fallout 3 isn't bad. It's just astonishingly shallow and linear compared to New Vegas. Uh, Fallout 3 is bad. And the reason Fallout 3 is bad is because of the work of a hack. A hack that took all the interesting aspects of Fallout 1 and Fallout 2 and made a facsimile of it in a plot that really didn't make any sense. I mean, all they, all they did essentially was take the Fallout universe and put it into... Um, uh, the Morrowind engine, and I mean, it's basically go around and um, you know shoot monsters in you know a, a post-apocalyptic setting. And uh, what I find remarkable about the Bethesda Fallout games compared to New Vegas is that there really seems to be no innovation. I mean, Bethesda doesn't seem to know what time is. They don't seem to understand that two hundred years is like a civilization-defining amount of time. And it's as if the bombs dropped about five years ago. I mean, it really is. I, it always breaks my immersion. But anyway, uh, Darth Kilhoon for $5 just started from the beginning. So I'll be caught up on four hours. Or maybe I should just save this for my department, for my deployment, US Army. Uh, God bless. You really fight in the US Army? Oh, dear. Um, well, I, I wish you good luck, um, Darth Kilhoon, if, uh, if that's the case. I wouldn't want anything bad to happen to you, but uh, I don't listen to me on double time speed. Um, then you'll only be caught up in two hours, but thank you. Uh, C, $2, dreams are voices from the deep. Well, I, I like to end the idea that um, 
Morrowind as a civilization begins through the intercession of dreams and the subtle manipulation of the gods on Veloth and stirring his charismatic personality. And then using that same methodology, Degofer attempts to, using his charismatic personality, stir the people of Morrowind to some sort of um, true, purist, unadulterated uh, form of Morrowind civilization, completely uncorrupted by foreign civilization. Um, the, the prevalence of dreams and the thematic sort of continuity of manipulation and uh, destiny and free will is all it's all brilliant and Morrowind. All right, I've uh, I've lost my voice, so all I can say again is uh, thank you, everyone, so much for listening, and uh, thank you for tolerating uh, this completely novel format. Like I said, um, I really think it's going to be a, a one-off. Um, I'm not really sure what's going to happen after this or when, um, but nevertheless, thank you so much for listening, and good night.